Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call this Bloomington City Council meeting to order. It's Monday, November 27th, 2023. Thank you all for joining us here in the Council Chambers. Thanks to everybody watching this evening online. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, welcome to everyone. Hope everybody had a good long holiday weekend. Council, our first item this evening is to uh, approve tonight's agenda. And on our agenda, under introductory items, we have actually six items under the introductory items. We're going to have uh, Councilmember Moore taking the oath of office. We've got a proclamation for Bloomington Symphony Orchestra Day. Looking forward to that. We've got appointments then to our HRA board, our planning commission, and the merit board. And then we're going to have an update on our federal lobbying efforts. Under item three, our consent business, Councilmember Lohman has the consent item, items this evening, and we have 11 of those tonight. Hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we've got seven items there, and we kind of go back and forth between a number of different things. Uh, the first is a resolution regarding uh, uh, approval to the issuance of revenue bonds. The second uh, is also a resolution regarding our proposed ch changes to fees and uh, charges schedule. There will be a public comment opportunity for that. We will have then two public hearings, one on an ordinance to increase our waste water and water rates. Uh, item 4.4 is an ordinance to increase our solid waste and refuse collection fees. Back to resolutions for item 5 to, charge a, to, to change our stormwater charges. And a resolution on item 4.6 approving the 2024 utility fund budgets. And then back to a public hearing again, this being the Human Rights Commission ordinance. Our final items of the evening are under our organizational business. Item 5.1 is regarding our business assistance programs, and item 5.2 is regarding our signed ordinance study discussion. That's our second time we're going to be taking that on, and we'll wrap up as we typically do with our City Council policy and issue updates. Council, any corrections, updates, or additions to our agenda this evening? If not, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve tonight's agenda. No further Council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And with that, it's my opportunity to mention that Councilmember D'Alessandro is not with us this evening. She is actually on vacation, so good for her. I hope she's enjoying someplace warmer than it is here in Bloomington right now. We have an agenda, so now our first agenda item is item 2.1, which is the oath of office for Councilmember Mua. Our city clerk, Christina Scipioni, is going to be administering the oath of office. But first of all, if you could, uh, Ms. Scipioni, could you explain to us why Councilmember Moo is being sworn in tonight as opposed to January 2nd? Certainly. Hello, Mayor and City Council. Um, so Councilmember Moo is being sworn in this evening because we had a vacancy in our council office um, for his at-large seat earlier this year um, due to the election of Nathan Coulter to the state um, legislature. And so the council made an appointment, which was Zamua, um, until the successor was elected at a regularly scheduled city election. And so we had that election earlier this month, um, and the results are now official for that. They were canvassed. The recount period has passed. And so now... Um, Samua's new term in office um, is effective today, and so we're doing our swearing in today. Um, the oaths of office for the remainder of the council members that were elected and our newly incoming council member will be at the beginning of January when those terms begin. Thank you for that explanation. I think people will just wonder why we're swearing in council member Mua and none of the other official swearings in, so I appreciate that explanation. Mm -hmm. Council member Mua. Why don't you take yourself, uh, take yourself center stage and let's do this. I know there's a lot of family here, and this is a big and special night. I would encourage you, do not be shy. This is going to happen, and it's a special time. So if you need to get up and get yourself in a good position to take a picture, get in a good position to take a picture. Hi. <laughs> All right, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I saw Mua do solemnly swear. I saw Mua do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the state of Minnesota. 
in the state of Minnesota and faithfully discharge the duties and faithfully discharge the duties of the office of council member at large of the office of council member at large of the city of Bloomington of the city of Bloomington in the county of Hennepin in the county of Hennepin and state of Minnesota and state of Minnesota to the best of my judgment and ability to the best of my judgment and ability congratulations We'll now have Council Member Mua sign his official oath. <laughs> I'm pleased to present you with your certificate of election. Congratulations. Congratulations, Council Member Mua. Very happy to have you sworn in officially. I think I mentioned last at our last meeting, this, these past few months, it's like your red shirt year. It's like your, your red shirt year, and now you're, you're fully on board and looking forward to all the good things that uh, you're going to be accomplishing over the next couple of years. Would you like to say anything? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I mean, first of all, I just wanted to thank my family for being here. Thank my, my wife, Shauna, for putting up with everything over the last year. Um, she's really been our rock at home, so I appreciate all the support here. And then also seeing my kids here and how excited they are about city council. I think they bring the viewership of our city council meetings down probably about 50 years. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, but that's wonderful to, to see how that's engaging um, them and, and, and bringing more, you know, light into what we do here in city council. So looking forward to what we're going to do over the next uh, couple of years here. And so uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Next on our agenda is our proclamation for the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra Day. I'm going to head down to the... Po I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I turned you red. I got you. You're not going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Our proclamation this evening is regarding uh, Bloomington Symphony Orchestra Day, and it's uh, recognizing the 60th anniversary of the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra. I know we have some representatives. Come on up. What I'd like to do is, is have you up here with me as I read uh, the proclamation, and we'll turn the microphone over to you. And then, of course, we've got to do the grip and grin and, and get the camera out and, and take our pictures as well. So good evening and welcome. Thanks for being here this evening. Proclamation this evening for Bloomington Symphony Orchestra Day, November 27, 2023. Whereas it, it is with great pleasure and profound honor that I extend heartfelt congratulations to the 75-member Bloomington Symphony Orchestra and their music director, Manny Luriano, on the momentous occasion of the 60th anniversary. And whereas for six decades, the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra has brought music lovers and accomplished musicians together to experience inspirational performances of orchestral music with community as the cornerstone. And whereas the talented musicians of the BSO who are guided by the values of excellence, collaboration, and dedication, have come, to the, have come to the city to rehearse every week for the past 60 years. And whereas, through countless performances, educational initiatives, and community engagements, touching the lives of hundreds of thousands of audience members, the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra has contributed to the city's mission of cultivating an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. And whereas the orchestra's unwavering dedication to the pursuit of musical excellence has not only entertained but also inspired generations of residents to appreciate the beauty and the power of music and proven its commitment to the cultural and artistic growth in Bloomington. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Tim Bussey, Mayor of the City of Bloomington, do hereby proclaim November 27th as Bloomington Symphony Orchestra Day in celebration of their 60th anniversary. I urge all residents to join me in recognizing and applauding the outstanding achievements of the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra and express our deepest gratitude for their enduring con contribution to the cultural vitality of our city, dated this 27th day of November, 2023. Congratulations. I mean, 60 years uh, is an impressive run of any community organization anywhere for, for any reason, but for a symphony orchestra that is so unique to a community of, of 90,000 people, it is absolutely unique. So congratulations, and I hope you offer and extend our congratulations 
to the rest of the orchestra as well. And um, just so proud and so very happy. And, and as I promised, I will be happy to turn the microphone over. Please. Please. Thank you, Your Honor. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this proclamation on behalf of the musicians, the board, and quite frankly, the audiences that have come to, my, to, our, to our concerts, whether they've been at the Normandale Bandshell or at the Schneider Theater or the Masonic Heritage uh, Center or Orchestra Hall. We have been very proud to present concerts with the name Bloomington attached to them. And we hope that this continues on for a good long time. We thank you very much. We have to do the official grip and grin. Who wants to grab the official picture? <laughs> gonna, why don't we step over here so we can sure. clear the podium, hand you the proclamation. Next up are items 2.3, 4, and 5, where we're going to be doing appointments for 2.3 is for our HRA board, and 2.4 is for our planning commission, and 2.5 is for the merit board. And council, the HRA board appointment is a bit of a unique one because officially, according to our, our city charter, it is a, it is a uh, mayor's appointment. And um, now we went through the interview process, we went through uh, the same process that we would do otherwise, it's just a matter of the, uh, the language of the charter that it's, it is an appointment and it isn't a, a vote of the city council. And so after the, uh, the, the work that we did and the, the look that we had, uh, I'm going to make the recommendation, council, that we appoint uh, Samuel Ria Issy to the term from January 1st. To, I'm sorry, correct me, Jamie. <laughs> Samira, thank you. Samira Issy to a term from January 1st, 21-24 to December 31st, 2028, to uh, our HRA Board of Directors. Second. We have a motion and a second to make the appointment as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thank you so very much. Next up are our Planning Commission appointment, appointments. And with the uh, Planning Commission, we had, I believe, four applicants, and I think there are there's, there will be one appointment made. And once again, if you within your packet, we have a recommendation from the interview panel that did, um, that did do the interviews. I'm trying to catch up here with my, there they are. On our interview panel, uh, we had, uh, I believe, Council Member Martin, Council Member D'Alessandro, and, uh, and then Paige Roman, the chair of our planning commission as well. And uh, Council Member Martin, of, if you want to give us a, a, just a brief overview of the, the discussion that the planning or that your interview panel had and the, the recommendation that you'd be making for the council today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was really heartened. We had um, uh, some really enthusiastic, experienced folks put their names forward to participate, especially uh, our final two, uh, as the packet recognizes. Uh, Mr. Ise and Mr. Cunningham both uh, had some really interesting takes on the direction uh, of the board and the effect it's had on work they've done previously. I know um, our final recommendation for Abdi Shakur uh, is a business owner in the community and had thoughts about how the decisions of the Planning Commission affect um, their day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so in the end, we did uh, recommend moving forward with uh, Mr. Ise, but uh, again, I, I, was, I thought it was pretty incredible to see so many folks willing to toss their hats in the ring and spend a lot of time to move the community forward. Council, any questions in Council Member Martin? Well, this, unlike the HRA appointment, this is actually a vote that we do go through here. Uh, we have the recommendation of the interview panel, and we will be taking a vote. Uh, everybody gets one vote for the, the one opening that we do have on the Planning Commission. And uh, Council Member, let's see, I'm, I was looking at my list here, Council Member 
D'Alessandro was scheduled to start our, our uh, voting here today, but it looks like we're going to start with uh, Council Member Mua gets our first vote this evening, and we'll work our way right down the line. Council Member Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll vote for Abdi Shakur IC. <clears throat> Council Member Nelson. Kevin Cunningham. Council Member Carter. Uh, Cunningham. Council Member Lohman. I'll go with uh, Abdish Carr Izzo. Council Member Martin. I will do uh, Mr. Issey as well. And I will cast my vote for Council Member or for Mr. Issey as well. Which, if my math is correct, it looks like we have four votes. Do I hear a motion to appoint uh, Mr. Issey to the Planning Commission opening that we have? So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Mua to appoint Abhidishkar Isse. I'm sure I butchered the name once again, and I apologize for that. Abdi Shukar, thank you very much. Abdi Shukar Isse uh, to our appointment on the Planning Commission. Any further council discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 5 1 with Council Member <laughs> Nelson in opposition. Thank you very much. And now we have uh, our final appointments of the evening are for our merit board. And we have uh, two openings and actually two, uh, one applicant seeking reappointment. Uh, we've got a number of, we have two openings and two applicants, one of them seeking reappointment. Uh, we've got Casey Kane and John Law, Locks uh, I'm applying for our merit board. Um, we could either th go through the vote council or we could, we could make the motion to make the appointment. So moved. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Motion by Council Member, um, Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Nelson. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, Nelson. To appoint Casey Kane and John Locks to our merit board. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much. Our final item tonight under item two, our introductory items, is an update on our federal lobbying. And we have a representative of our federal lobbying crew here this evening, in from D.C. by way of Maryland and, and Bloomington, Indiana, from what, yes. I, from what I understand. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Welcome. Hi. I am so glad to be with you today. I'm Emily Tranner with Primacy Strategy Group. Um, we are the city's federal team in Washington, D.C., um, and I think we've, uh, we've been doing work with you for about uh, four years now. Um, but uh, I, though I've been in D.C. since... 2004 I did grow up in the metro area and our firm is based here in the metro area so we have a really nice kind of feel of back and forth and in, in home uh, versus DC so I just wanted to give you a quick update on your federal priorities as we you, not the full picture but just a couple of pieces that have been moving forward um, and kind of give you a sense of what to expect next um, so as you are well aware, you know, there's been chaotic times in Washington, D.C. the last several months, right, um, <laughs> with lots of speaker elections and almost shutdowns and not government shutdowns. Um, but for right now, we are holding the line here, and we do have a federal budget that goes until January uh, 19th and February 2nd, <laughs> respectively. It's very confusing. But in order to avoid the shutdown that um, the most recent shutdown on November 17th, Congress decided with the leadership of Mike Johnson, uh, Speaker, that they would do a laddered approach, which functionally does nothing at the end of the day, except it gives us a little bit more time to, um, to debate some of the bills, eight of the 12, that need to be passed in full for us to have a full fiscal year 2024 budget, which we are technically in right now. They technically go from to September 30th. Um, or October 1st to September 30th. In my tenure, in my 20 years in D.C., I have not seen a budget pass on time. Um, Emily, but I, we're usually I, in a scramble, Emily, right? Can I interrupt for just yes, a second please. and ask you to pull the microphone closer? Oh, sure. To you, if I could, please. Is that just better? Just to make sure that we can hear you throughout the, throughout the building and, and throughout uh, on, on our cable the city. Is that better? That's much better. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry. So we are under a continuing resolution right now, which usually during right around the holidays is when there's a mad scramble to have a full budget, but they avoided that by extending it till next year um, and early in the year. And I can't tell you with any certainty that there will be less issues 
you know, negotiating a full budget come January, February, because we're still in the same Congress, still with the same majority and minorities, and still with the same president. However, right now we're set until then. Um, and what we do in D.C. is really just watch for, um, you know, opportunities to plug in the city's priorities and raise your pro your profile within your membership, you know, your federal delegation, which you are all, you know, exceptionally well known among our senators and your congressmen. But as you know, as you well know, your Congress changes and new members come in, which we will be looking at in 2024. So having that um, that Bloomington presence in Washington, D.C. is really, really key towards towards your goal. Um, so I wanted to just give you a couple of, you know, m underneath the chaos, although it's really, you know, can it seem like Washington doesn't do anything, which, you know, that's a fair assessment. <laughs> Sometimes there are things happening, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes is the wrong words, but a steady flow of motion forward on things that matter to municipalities. And in really what we're looking at right now is the playing out of these major federal policy initiatives and funding initiatives that were passed in the last three years that are now long-term bills, like IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that's a five-year bill. And the Inflation Reduction Act um, is a 10-year bill. And there are new provisions in each of these that, you know, that were really interesting for municipalities. One example is direct pay for out of IRA for investments um, in renewables that that federal funding or excuse me, the tax benefit can come straight back to the city. That hasn't happened before this administration and this bill. Um, but two of the projects that you as a counselor last year moved forward as sort of priority projects to keep in the process, the earmarking process, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a moment, um, they, those continue to move forward. I'm going to give you just a, a synopsis of where we're at with the, with the earmark process and then what to expect next. So under this continuing resolution that we are, um, we are operating under now. It's, there is no new funding, it's all the same levels, and there's no new policy. However, we have been going through the earmark process or congressionally directed spending process since last March. And we did submit in that process uh, federal funding for requests for the um, for dr new drinking water supply for the city and also for the Small Business Development Center. And right now, um, one of those projects moved forward in this year's process. Um, so in the House, the well project has about $979,000, and in the Senate, there's $1.01 million. Um, and it's, we are pushing for the higher amount to be in the final bill, which will be fantastic. The Small Business Center did not make it in the final bill, although our senators did put that forward and supported it very, very strongly. So essentially where we're at is we are waiting for a full budget to, that will have these member-directed projects or congressionally-directed spending. They are items that your members of Congress, Dean Phillips and the senators, say, hey, that project is good for my district. So it's not a, you know, it's not a Department of Energy decision or interior decision, it's a congressional decision. And that is a really strong tool for our members to bring back to their cities and counties. And only municipalities and nonprofits are are eligible for this process, and they aren't huge amounts. These are not the $60 million that the city was a leader on for infra grants. This isn't, you know, um, $100 million for a big bridge. These are 1.2 to 5, biggest one is around $7 million, kind of in the world of earmarks. And so what to expect next is because we are under this continuing resolution, um, we still have to negotiate a full budget, which will include or would include these projects. And there was some fear or concern that the earmarks would just be slashed at the end for us to get a full budget. That is certainly not you know, impossible, and I can't guarantee that earmarks will stay in this, this budget once we get a full fiscal year 2024 budget done. However, they are not in anyone's crosshairs, and they are becoming increasingly popular on both sides of the aisle and both chambers. So we feel really good about the opportunity for the Well Project to move forward in the final bill. And we're going to be working with your staff and, you know, and understanding what's next, which is right when we pass that fiscal year 2024 budget, we're going to have to start the next year's budget process because that moves all the way back. You know, if we're looking for when it's supposed to pass in September, it works backwards till about March where we have to start this process. So over the next couple of months, we'll be working to make sure we've got viable 
you know, projects that, that the council mayor and council supports that we put forward in this process. But we're also looking at infrastructure, IIJA, and IRA funding to see if there's any places there that can be used for these priority projects or opportunistic plays, basically. Okay, this just popped up. This would be great for the city of Bloomington. Let's connect on it and, and really dig in and advocate and, and um and support it out in Washington, D.C. So that's where we're at right now. It's it's incredibly complicated. Even, you know, I've never seen anything like this. And most people that I work with have never seen anything like this in Washington, D.C. It's really kind of bizarre and unprecedented, as they say. However, as I said, there are things happening behind the scenes, and we continue to push forward and make sure that you know Bloomington is front and center as the, as there's funding opportunities that come down the pike, and as you know major policy decisions are made that we're making sure that we're not only being uh, proactive about funding opportunities, but playing defense on things you know along with your counterparts in the, across the country and municipalities, your size, larger and smaller. So I'd be happy to ask answer any questions and I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight although it is way colder here than it is in DC but I don't mind that much so thank you <laughs> thank you Mr. Andrew. questions council I'm just going to turn to Mr. Verbrugge very quickly here and if you could give a, a, a quick description or synopsis of the well project that uh, Mr. Andrew was talking about. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, actually, I see that uh, uh, Scott Anderson is our utility superintendent. He's been working hard on this project. So I'm going to invite Mr. Anderson up to uh, talk about it real quickly. Good evening, Mayor. Mr. Anderson. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Council Members. Um, not expecting uh, this night, but um, we have been working on this for a long time, so I'm, I'm pretty uh, in tune with what we're doing. We have, um, as you... As you likely know, we, uh, the city has a dual uh, water supply uh, for, our, for our customers and residents. We purchase service water from the city of Minneapolis, and then we lime soften and treat groundwater from six existing uh, deep wells uh, here in Bloomington. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of those wells uh, began and, and ultimately reached its end of life, <clears throat> and so we've been working on plans to um, a, abandon that well and then develop a new well so that we are, we're able to maintain kind of the firm capacity or the, the minimum capacity of our treatment plant, maintain the resiliency of that dual source system, um, and maintain our water quality. So we, we through that process, um, uh, completed a feasibility study, um, a siting analysis, and then put together a budget. Um, as, as Ms. Tranter pointed out, um, a couple of, of stars aligned and we saw an opportunity, so um, we put some things together um, and, and visited D.C. and, and made our, our pitch for, for that project as well as the Small Business Center project. And um, we made some, made some headway there and, and you know, so far, and so hopefully if things um, continue as, as Emily mentioned um, we'll we'll see some we'll actually see that coming through hopefully in 2024 we uh, plans and specs are underway currently um, and we're looking to to bid that project early in 2024 so um, we'll be moving and hopefully uh, have that funding to to help us out thank you for that and just for everyone's information where would it be located uh, it will be located at Tarnhill Park south kind of south edge of Tarnhill Park just north of 98th Street very good Thank you. Thank you. Council, any questions on a quick update? Council Member Lohman? No? I'm sorry. Any questions on that? Very good. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Tranter? Council Member Lohman. Thank you. I can't let you come all the way here and not ask one okay. question. <laughs> I'll try to keep it quick because I know we've got a, a busy uh, uh, agenda there. Um, so I know we've got a fair amount, and you mentioned the earmark process has got its limitations, but those other two bills that you mentioned, because I'm not a federal person, I'm not going to even attempt to try to <laughs> uh, uh, n note those. But I'm just wondering in terms of you know what you've seen other cities do, You know, we have a fair number of capital um, uh, things that are within our CIP mm -hmm. um, that we can, I, I, know, I don't want to talk details here, but, you know, what are some things we could maybe look to try to do to try to take advantage of some of those funds that are out there um, that would be advantageous for us as a city uh, since we have, you know, quite a few capital expenses that are in our, our uh, CIP that need to be uh, resolved? I do a question there for you. Yeah, I think, I mean, unprecedented in the, in the, 
chaos and then unprecedented in the investment right now and, and see how that's playing out. And so I think a lot of um, the investment is into hard infrastructure. So you are putting forward your water projects. You know, you did secure $60 million for number one transportation project out of infra grants for 494, which that program existed before the big infrastructure influx of funding, but it was you know, really, really flooded with more funding. Um, so in your capital improvement projects, you know, interchanges, um, you know, street improvements, and those you, portions of those can be in the earmark process. But um, a lot of what we are seeing in both the Infrastructure Investment Act and then the Infrastructure, or excuse me, the Inflation Reduction Act um, is new programs for energy efficiency, so installations of energy efficiency um uh, you know, capabilities in your buildings. And then uh, also all of your sort of street and road improvement projects, if they have a component that saves miles, uh, you know, miles driven or helps with congestion, things like that, those are all, that's the lens that the Biden administration is really looking through right now. So that's, that's what's exciting too is if you look at the list of projects primacy can can you know we'll talk to staff and look at all the pieces and say okay you know this this project's 5.6 million but if you if we can get a million for it in earmarks that's where we're going to go for it or this is big enough and has all the components to go for a raise grant or a protect grant um which has a lot of of the sort of environmental um pieces to it as well. So there are multiple discretionary grant programs and, and uh, processes that we could request hard infrastructure projects for. And then there is also formula dollars have been way boosted up. And, and at the state, the state of Minnesota has received federal funds from, and working through Federal Highway Administration, those funds for um, for MnDOT and projects that are uh, in the city that are MnDOT led or managed, you know, that money has been boosted up too. So we can look and say, this would really be, make sense for you to go the state angle, partner with MnDOT here because this, this funding stream has really been plussed up. So without looking at the individual projects, but working backwards, size, size of the project matter and cost of the project matters in terms of where you're going to look, uh, in infrastructure investment or, you know, inflation reduction act, uh, and, and then if it is a small enough project for earmarks, that's where it gets exciting because it can it most of the 12 bills, so energy and water, interior, transportation and HUD, um, even financial services, they're all earmarks. So you can be a little bit more outside the box rather than just, you know, street interchange or um, or wastewater treatment, which those are really great projects to put forward and put forward in that process. But but there's sort of a, a more expansive um you know, because sort of categories in the earmarking process. Additional questions, Council? Very good. Well, thank you. Thanks for making the trip here, and thanks for all your work. And I know you do a lot of work in D.C. on behalf of Bloomington, and I know that um, if the Council doesn't know, Primacy was a great advocate for the city uh, as we were deep in the expo, and so they did outstanding work. And uh, thank you for that, and if you could extend... Your thanks to the rest of your staff as well. I will. And um, tell them we look forward to seeing them soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank and you. we'll see you soon, I hope. Thanks. <clears throat> Moving on, Council, to item three on our agenda that's the consent business. Councilmember Lohman has our consent agenda tonight. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you. I'll make one last call for anything holds. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and move 3.1 through 3.11. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to accept tonight's consent business as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Moving on to item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And our first item tonight is a resolution. Item 4.1 is a resolution providing preliminary approval to the issuance of revenue bonds for the benefit of SRPB Strategic Housing, LLC, with respect to a multifamily housing development. And that's a mouthful, and I'm sure Lori economy Scholler, our CFO here in Bloomington, is going to explain this to us. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, before you again is the resolution for the preliminary approval. This would be a conduit bond issue, and we are looking, um, this 
is the 700 American Project. Um, and this is for 128 unit affordable senior multi family building with 1,500 square feet of commercial space. Um, the developer, Schaefer Richardson, was selected by an RFE process in late um, 22. Um, the project is a development entitled project and was recommended for approval by the Planning Commission on November 16th. Um, the City Council um, can consider approval of the land use entitlements on December 18th when this project comes back. Um, and the project was recently recommended for funding from the Metropolitan Council's Livable Communities Demonstration Account Grant for $1,790,000, yeah, $1, which is expected to be approved by Metropolitan Council on December 13th. Um, Julie Eddington is with us, our, our bond attorney, and she will be the conduit bond attorney for this deal. Um, my general understanding of the process is once we give the preliminary approval, or council of, uh, gives a preliminary approval for this, they will submit an application to the state to get bonding authority. Um, and depending on where they're at in the mixture of all the other applications, um, they may get authorization in January and they may have to wait to the next round in midsummer. So this is just their preliminary process, and we would be acting as the conduit bond um, issuer for them for this state bonding. And as all with conduit bonds, this is not an obligation of the city of Bloomington. You're good, thank you, I appreciate that. So council, this is 700 American Boulevard. I think when we approved this, when we first talked about this, we, we talked about the variety of funding sources that they would be working toward, and this is one of those funding sources that they're trying to to work their way through at this time. Any questions, Council? Comments at all? Uh, Council Member Nelson. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Just for clarification, this is not the final approval. This is the approval of the request, and then it'll come back for final approval. Is that generally correct? Our bond attorney just nodded yes. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. And that we are not financially obligated um, does that include if for some reason they defaulted, we still would not be obligated? On a conduit bond through yeah. the state, we would not be part of any default. The city is exempt from all of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nelson. Any additional questions, Council? As I said, Council, this is a, uh, a resolution, and so I'd be looking for a motion to ad adopt this resolution. Council Member Lohman. Mayor, I'll move uh, a resolution approving the 2024, uh, oh, pardon me, I'm in the wrong one here. Let me try that. I'll move to approve a resolution providing preliminary approval to the issuance of multifamily housing revenue notes for the benefit of SRPB Strategic Housing LLC. Second. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Mua to approve a resolution providing the preliminary approval of the issuance of multifamily housing revenue notes as stated. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you so much. We'll move on to item 4.2. And Ms. Economy Scholler will stay with us. This is a, uh, a resolution regarding proposed changes to our fees and charges schedule. We will have a public comment opportunity for this. Ms. Economy Scholler. Yes. Uh as um, waiting for the presentation to pull up, I just have a few slides for you. Um, in January 2000, Appendix B is what we've created through our fees and service charge schedules. There's an Appendix A through the ordinance, Appendix B and Appendix C. These are the Appendix B pieces of that for fees for services and charges adopted by resolution to be incorporated in the published city code um shortly before you will be uh, an ordinance one for a fee for utilities but for now this is the one. fee scheduled by resolution uh staff recommends approval of the resolution um, with all the proposed fees and changes you, in the packet and um posted before you is numerous lines of fee changes majority have been you know, let's see most of the the fees are doing through um in the Center for the Arts, youth programs, um, there's an animal shelter piece that aligns with our 
neighboring communities, and it really in, um, aligns well with the costs to maintain the animal in the, the animal shelter for the period of time that they're normally there. And that went up to $75. And then um, we're looking for some public comment on that. And um, that's all I have, that and the motion. Very good. Council, any questions of Ms. Economy Shoulder? Council Member Lohman. I'll ask the same questions I typically ask every time. And when we look at, at these fees and um, in terms of how we you know, either increase or decrease the fees, uh, um, what is kind of, how does the staff go about doing that would be my, kind of my first question. What's kind of the, you know, the, the policy uh, um, uh or the decision-making process in which to do that, make it. Uh, and then the secondary piece, when we look at business impact and uh, around equity pieces, um, have uh, um, how did you deal with those those types of things? So, in regards to the equity piece, um, I majority of these uh, have been in process for many many years. These rates. So, as we look to increase and change them. We look at inflation rates. We look at also the cost to operate that procedure or that program and then um, seeing where we can do that. We also look at comparisons with other communities to see that we are in alignment or um, if our costs are greater than our communities, we will look to find dig deeper into why those costs are in there. So um, we want to be comparable with our cities. We also want to be fair and reasonable on what we're asking our residents to pay for different programs or um, businesses as they're coming forward to engage with us. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Three probably very quick questions. Um, most of the increases were modest, which on one hand is good. Um, my question about that, though, is, I mean, we've seen significant inflation we're seeing that in our other budgets why are our fees not reflecting those same cost increases again i would um mayor and council member nelson we would look to see what we can afford and what the programs can sustain majority of our park and rec programs um do receive some tax levy support okay um Second question, um, very specifically to communications. I saw that there were no fee changes, and this gets back to the budget question again, uh, that you know we have challenges with our uh, communications budget because of our fees that we collect from the, uh, whatever it's called, uh, I forget the name of it now. But, um, and I noted that we didn't, we haven't increased those since 2019. Some of them go back to like 20 or 2006. Um, at what point do we start to look at those fees, um, given the budget challenges of that fund? Mr. Verbrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson. The fees uh, that you're describing that um, uh, are revenues for our communications division come from the franchise fee, the, the, yeah. the cable franchise fee. Uh, those are described in the franchise that we have with Comcast, uh, and um, they are fixed for the term of that contract. So the next uh, opening for the um, the franchise, uh, I believe, is coming due in 2026, if my memory serves, and uh, we will actually um, reach out and try to commence negotiation with them uh, as early as 2024, um, which is the process we normally use. It's a 10-year contract, and often there are many issues that take uh, – a fair amount of time to work through in addition to uh, requiring some study. And I'd say that this next franchise is uh, going to be very complicated in terms of negotiating um, rates and uh, understanding the capital issues and many other things in, in light of where we're at today. Mayor and Council Member Nelson, I would also add those items that were back in 2006 and even um, tend to be the media of people wanting to buy a DVD or a CD of events from us and uh, you know and, and generally we post um, a lot of the videos and stuff now right on YouTube so um, people can download from YouTube and watch it on YouTube without having to um, purchase a CD or a DVD from us for that information and, and just for a point of clarification I know they're funded by franchise fees but I don't think these are the franchise fees that we're looking at here and um, 
you know, I look at like an individual membership for the communication BCAT, uh, $50. It's been $50 since 2004, you know, and I, I guess that that's my question is the fees that we can control. At what point do we look at that if it's been nearly two decades and it hasn't changed? Mr. Hey, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, that's that's a good question. I think this one has uh, uh, more to do with what Ms. Economy Scholler was referencing, like with our park and recreation programs, right, where there's only so much that a, a participant is willing to pay. So we have to stay in lockstep with what we think the market is. Um, these those types of things that you're looking at just don't have a significant amount of usership, right? And so um, I, I think the sense has been um, we're, we're not going to get blood from a turnip, as it were. And so um, continuing to increase rates there is is not going to um, help us attract more users. So we probably lose more members than we gain in additional fees. Yeah. Price elasticity of demand. Um, my last question is, what is winter snow softball? Because it sounds fascinating, and it was new. Good. Allison <laughs> Warren just happens to be sitting here. Here we go. Uh, Mayor, council members, uh, soft, snow softball is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, playing softball in the snow. A number of our other communities around have tried it out, and so we thought we'd give it a shot this winter as well. So we'll let you know if it runs, and you can come check it out. Absolutely. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of questions. Uh, so I see a couple of new fees um, under the section, the um, Bloomington Ice Garden section. So high school game fee, cleaning fee. But I'm just wondering, um, what are those? I guess I don't really understand. Like, are those are the cleaning fees associated with the high school games and the cleaning fees there? Ms. Catcher, good evening. Councilmember Carter, thank you very much. Um, could you tell me again what the specific question about um, a cleaning yeah, fee? Yeah, so under the Bloomington Ice Garden, there are some brand new fees. Um, and one of them is a high school game event fee. Uh, and then there's a cleaning fee and a cleaning fee for all three sheets. And I guess I'm just, uh, it, it, I wasn't sure if the cleaning fees were associated with the high school game event fee or if they were just separate. So if there was a big tournament hosted by um, you know, the uh, local hockey association, would they then have cleaning fees associated with the rental of all three sheets for a tournament? Is that what, how I'm taking, am I taking that the right way? Mr. Sable, do we have Lenny? Yes, ma'am. Lenny, did you hear the question from council member Carter? I did, uh, mayor, council member Carter. Uh, we, added these fees in for they're separate so the cleaning fee isn't directly related to the high school uh, game fees uh, special event fees so major tournaments other major events at the rink um, that require additional like much more extensive cleanup and much more trash generation um, is something that uh, we've started looking at adding in so this last weekend when we had a tournament renting all three sheets of ice um, and had staff in the building significantly later than they normally would be um, cleaning up after a large event. It's one way to recoup some of those costs associated with that um, between the staff time and then just the <clears throat> extra amount of trash um, that goes into the dumpster. Okay, so it's more for those bigger events. It wouldn't um, pertain to say, I know like the local elementary schools will do a field trip to big, like would that apply to them as well? No, these would be okay. just applied for our major tournament weekends um, or major competition weekends um, where they're renting multiple sheets of ice. Um, so it might be one sheet of ice for the entire weekend um, or it might be multiple sheets. You know, if they rent all three sheets, we give them a little bit of a discount economy of scale per se. Um, like this last weekend, we had the gobbler. They had all three sheets rented all day Friday, all day Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, in that case, they would have paid the... Uh, the three sheet fee each day um, for the cleanup. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so my next question is actually, I think it's a Parks and Rec question. Um, so can you just um, remind us, there's recognized your user groups, which I see most of those fees did not change. And then there's private groups, which those increased. Um, so are the recognized user groups, like some of the 
youth athletic associations and Mayor Councilman Ricardo, the recognized groups are the local athletic associations, and they do p now pay a per player fee instead of a per um, field fee that are listed there. For that, are listed did that in increase? Groups. It did increase okay. to $13 per player. Um, this year, it was 11 the last two years, and it'll be 15 starting in 2026, and all of the associations are aware of those upcoming changes. Okay, so that's the RBYAO. Correct. Okay. Recognized Bloomington Youth Athletic Association. We love our acronyms. Okay, I was wondering. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and then my last question um, would be related to the between 15 to 20 percent increase in camp program fees. Um, and I will say, uh, years ago, I, I was shocked by how low how low the cost was for Camp Coda. So um, I'm not necessarily um, uh, against that change. <clears throat> I, I think we're still probably lower than like YMCA camp programs. Um, but I guess I would be interested in just hearing, you know, what is going into that increase just so that those in the public can hear um, why they'll be seeing those increases as well. Mayor, Councilmember Carter, along with that, uh, like Lori said, we do compare with other cities and other programs around the area, and we are still extremely low and comparable to others, especially for a week-long program that includes an overnight. It is extremely tax subsidized at the moment, and so we are using cost recovery and many business plans to identify where we can increase fees, and that would be one of them. Also recognizing that we do have our fee assistance program that is still available and changing for this upcoming 2024 season uh, to allow for additional fee assistance if necessary. Uh, thank you. I was going to ask about the fee assistance program because I knew there was one in place. So um, that's all the questions that I have. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Rebrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter. Uh, appreciate the uh, responses from Ms. Warren and especially the emphasis on the cost recovery uh, concept because um, you might recall this when we went through our park system master planning, that uh, notion of cost recovery uh, was something that we talked about. And as we're looking at our budgets going forward, we're going to be coming back to the council and having conversation about what your expectations are going to be. Because to your point, Council Member Carter, um, I think that many of our um, users and customers have been um, used to a certain level of charging for, um, for our programming. And as Ms. Warren mentioned, um, they're, they're very heavily tax subsidized, right? And so uh, trying to make sure that we get the balance right on what it is that uh, we're charging folks and, and um, what the council's expectations are going to be uh, will be an upcoming discussion. Council, anything additional? Item 4.2, any questions? Very good. As I said, this is a public comment opportunity. And I will open this public comment opportunity now. Is anyone here in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.2, a resolution regarding the proposed changes to fees and charges schedule? No one coming forward. Mr. Sable, is there anyone on the phone this evening? Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I do have a, a caller with the prefix 617519. You are now unmuted. Mm -hmm. Caller 617519, you are now live. All right. Sounds like we don't have anyone on the line. Very good. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I also have a Michael Dardis on the line. I... Okay. Yeah. Anyone else, Mr. Sable? Then, Mayor, that's it. Last call for anyone in the chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.2 this evening. Council, I don't see anyone coming forward, so I'm going to close the public comment period, uh, public comment opportunity for item 4.2. Council, any additional discussion on item 4.2? Or if not, I would look for action on item 4.2. Councilmember Martin. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy to make that motion. Just one last call for any comments or any questions, Council? All right, Councilmember Martin. I will move that we adopt a resolution approving the 2024 schedule of fees and charges, uh, Appendix B, fees and service charges schedule adopted by resolution. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt a resolution approving the 2024 schedule of fees and charges. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Next up is our item 4.3. This one is a public hearing. And this is regarding an ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates. 
Kari Carlson, our deputy finance officer, is here this evening, and I think actually you get the next four items as well. So yes, welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight is the public hearing for the 2024 utility rates and corresponding budgets. And this information we are presenting tonight is similar to what was presented at the October 16th and November 13th council meetings. However, I am going to run through it again quickly since this is the official public hearing. And I want to make sure that the members of the public who are watching tonight have this information in case they didn't see the previous council meetings where it was discussed. I will be presenting the information this evening, but we do have the utility fund managers here tonight to answer questions, um, including utility superintendent Scott Anderson and water resources manager Brian Greedle that are in the council chambers, and also solid waste program coordinator Laura Horner. She is online, and so, as I said, they're all available for answering questions. So the four utility funds are the water fund, the wastewater fund, the stormwater fund, and the Solid Waste Fund. The water utility provides high quality drinking water and this fund accounts for the costs related to the operation, maintenance and renewal of the water system. This graph here is the one that demonstrates that Bloomington continues to provide softened water at a relatively low cost. The blue bars represent softened water, the red bars represent unsoftened water, and the white bar here represents home softened water cost. So Bloomington has the second to the lowest softened water rate compared to these other cities. And for 2024, we are recommending that the rates for both tier one and tier two be increased by seven and a half percent. The tier two rate uh, goes into effect um, over 12,000 gallons for a bi-monthly period, so a two month period. And then this is the water fund long-term budget model with that seven and a half proposed rate increase. You can see that on the budget model that the working capital balance is in the green, which is our goal um, with this proposed rate increase. Um, for 2024, revenue is projected to be $21.7 million, and expenses are slightly higher than that at $21.9 million, with about $4.1 in capital. And that will bring down the working capital balance by around $200,000 um, in 2024, but keep it in line with the goal for this fund. Next, for the wastewater utility, the wastewater utility provides city sewer services, and this fund also accounts for the costs of operations, maintenance, and renewal, but for the wastewater system. And as discussed before, a significant expense in this fund are the wastewater sewer collection system charges from, from the Metropolitan Council Environmental Services. And in 2024, that'll be uh, $9 million. This slide shows that Bloomington's wastewater rates are among the lowest in our peer cities. And for 2024, we're recommending that the rates are increased by 4%. So going from $5.29 to $5.50 per 1,000 gallons. And then next, here's the wastewater long-term budget model with that 4% increase that we're proposing. And with that, the forecasted revenues would be at $14.9 million and expenses at $15.2 million, bringing down the working capital balance by about $248,000 in 2024, but still remaining um, pretty much in the goal until 2027. The next utility fund is the stormwater, and that manages excess rainwater to prevent flooding and improve water quality bef before it enters our ponds, lakes, and rivers. This graph shows an annual family stormwater rate for Bloomington residents compared to surrounding communities. And on this one, um, Brooklyn Center's um, at the lowest there at $73.17 per year. Minneapolis here is the highest at $216.75 per year. 
And then Bloomington here is in the upper middle. And so we're currently at $105 per year for 2023, um, which is shown in blue there. And then the proposed in orange is at $112.32 per year, um, shown in the orange on this graph. We're proposing that the rates increase by 7%. The storm water rates are determined by land use category at a per acre rate. So as I said, we're proposing a 7% increase. Each single family residential lot is considered to be one third of an acre. So the proposed 2024 rate at that one third acre would be $9.36 per month. Here's the stormwater long-term budget model with a 7% increase, which would have revenues forecasted at $8.2 million and expenses at $9.6 million, which will bring down the working capital balance by around $1.4 million, a little bit under, uh, in 2024. So the working capital balance dips down to 80% of the goal for the fund in 2026, but it's projected to go back up to 90% in 2027. And then the last utility fund tonight is the Solid Waste Utility, which provides uh, service for garbage, recycling, organics, yard waste, bulky item management, storm cleanups, and environmental health abatements. So in 2024 budget, the forestry, forestry activity for diseased tree removal is moving uh, from this fund to the Parks and Recreation Special Revenue Fund now that park maintenance has moved from the Public Works Department to the Parks and Recreation Department. Here are the proposed 2024 garbage rates that are made up of um, four different components. So um, the collection rate that's set in our contract with the Garbage Haulers Consortium is a part of the rate driver. Also the disposal rate um, that's set in the contract with the consortium there's an administrative fee um, that covers billing, customer service, education, and contract administration. And then there is um, kind of a pass-through fee for the state solid waste tax and the county fee. Um, next, the recycling rates, um, proposing a 3% increase. And the rate drivers consist of a price escalator, again, set in the contract for collection as well as a recycling commodity adjustment offset that is established annually. And that is determined by the published commodity indices and the composition of what our residents are recycling. The organics recycling service began last year in March 2022. And like regular recycling, the rate is paid by all residents who have city garbage and recycling service. Um, the rate is increasing by 17 cents per month, so it's going from $5.50 to $5.67. And uh, residents do need to sign up for a cart, and currently um, just under 28% of households are participating. And then the bulky item management rate, that was reduced by 16% last year after some um, program changes. And the program changes included going from an every year curbside cleanup to an every other year curbside cleanup. So 2024, there's going to be a curbside cleanup. Um, there's also now a community drop-off event, community swap events, and a portion of this rate does go towards cleanup if there's a major storm event. This is the solid waste long-term budget model with um, on average 4.66% increase for the garbage and 3% for recycling and organics increases. 2024 um, has revenues at $10.2 million and expenses budgeted at $10.9 million. The 2024 budget has $1.4 million budgeted for the curbside cleanup, as I talked about. And the working capital does dip down to 74% of the goal in 26, but it's projected to go back up to about 87% in 2027. This next slide 
it's just showing some key rate drivers for utility rates. So for the water, wastewater, and stormwater utilities, the key rate drivers are the increases in supplies, um, contract services materials, um, costs that we're seeing there, and project costs for asset renewal and replacement. The wastewater utility also has that significant charge from the Met Council Environmental Services. And for solid waste, the drivers include the collection price escalator that's set in that contract with the haulers, the disposal costs from HERC, admin charges, and then those pass-through taxes for Minnesota State Solid Waste and Hennepin County. And as we said before, it's not just the operations uh, maintenance of these utilities. Some of the big expenses for the water, wastewater, and stormwater are the planned um, asset renewal of infrastructure. So just some just some of the examples of planned utility projects um, include the $1.3 million to replace one of the city's six drinking water supply wells, $9 million planned for construction necessary for dewatering secondary solids at the water treatment plant, $6 million for AMI, or Advanced Metering Infrastructure, and um, those are all for the water fund, and then $2.7 million for a Penn Lake stormwater project, which had been listed by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency as impaired for nutrients. And this work was identified as part of the Penn Lake hydrology study completed last year. So here is a recap of the proposed rate increases for tonight's public hearing. So water at a 7.5%, wastewater at 4%, stormwater at 7%, um, an average of the small, medium, and large cards for garbage at 4.66%, recycling 3%, bulky item management 3%, and organics 3%. And then this is the recap um, with all the utility rates combined just to show a total increase based on average usage. Um, as a reminder, utility bills are sent once every eight weeks, so they're sent out bi-monthly. So for, let's say, small garbage use, minimal water use, or small garbage can, minimal water use would be an increase of $5.50 for a two-month period, or $33 per year. A medium garbage can and medium water use would be an increase of $10.05 for that two-month period, or $60.30 for the year. And then a large garbage and um, larger water use would be an increase of $19.54 for a two-month period, or $117.24 a year. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. Council questions? <coughs> Council Member Loman. Um, so um, when we look across many of the budgets uh, that were there, we saw a number of the working capital uh, percentages, and this is more so for a question for uh, those folks who are watching at home, uh, and they see this working capital that's over 100% and in green, um, you know, some may look at that and say, you know, there's several of these examples that are out there, they may say, hey, well, gosh, you know, we're, you know, we're getting taxed, is this a place where uh, the, the council could reduce that amount and get it down to 100% and then give those dollars back to the uh, uh, to the residents, and I wanted to just see, just in general, you know, what that means when uh, we have some of those capital expenses that are over 100 percent. So, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Council Member Lowen, so you can see we're showing um, a portion of these long-term budget models. Um, it's already getting kind of small, going out to 2027. But in all of those, you can see what we're projecting out is for them not to be over 100 percent of the goal, but for them to sometimes even dip down to under 80 percent um, and so once it gets below the 90 percent of that goal um, it gets it shows yellow just as a color indicator um, kind of caution and then once it gets below um, the 80 percent it goes down to it turns red automatically so um, it's just showing that what we have what we are planning to have available for future capital projects might not be there we might need to find a different funding source than the actual money in these funds 
So really, uh, these these short term kind of things we're looking at kind of uh, ignore the long term kind of uh, model that we have out there to some degree. When you kind of see that, I mean, it's it's there, but you know, when we have those short uh, pieces there, it sometimes can get a little bit lost in there. I, I do know that when folks are just tuning in, you know, they haven't watched any of this stuff and they're just seeing this for the first time, there may be some concern with that. But I just wanted to just kind of bring. I know we had a quite lengthy conversation um, about that before, but I wanted to just bring that forward as folks are looking at that as we kind of move towards the end of the uh, the pieces. And then I also wanted to just mention uh, more commentary that, uh, you know, looking at the garbage rates and that type of thing, that there is a study that uh, the council and the staff are looking to try to do to try to see if there's a way that we can uh, make some changes uh, with, with those rates. So that's all I had to comment or question. Thank you, Council Member. And to your point regarding the capital fund balances, yes, we did have the discussion, and we one of the directions we gave to the to the staff was that we're going to continue that conversation in depth and see where the council is comfortable in terms of uh, not just where they are in terms of the red, green, yellow, but where they are set at just in general. Are, is it an appropriate level? And if not, uh, what is the more appropriate level for the the goals that we're trying to accomplish? And uh, all the goals that we're trying to accomplish, to have that working capital balance, but at the same time trying to balance the the, the, the tax revenue that is, is collected to keep those balances where they are. Council, any other questions or comments on Ms. Carlson's presentation? Hearing none, we have item 4.3 is a, uh, a public hearing. And I will open the public hearing now. This is a public hearing on the ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates. Item 4.3. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.3 this evening? Mr. Sable, is there anyone on the line? Uh, thank you, Mayor. No one on the line. Last call for anyone in the chambers to come forward and speak on item 4.3. Council, no one on the line. I see no one coming forward in the council chambers. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.3. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Carter to close the public hearing on item 4.3. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Council, any discussion on our water and wastewater rates? I think this is, uh, I mean, we, we see example after example in what we do and in, in the cost of things, but the, the cost of what we have for our water and wastewater is literally the cost of the water and the wastewater. It's the, uh, the operations of it, it's the deliverables, it's the infrastructure. Um, I, I hope there's the understanding from the general public this isn't, this isn't a, a city moneymaker, this isn't um, you know, a cash grab, this is simply a city service that is paying for itself. And, um, and that's the case with, with um, a, good chunk, a good chunk of what we're talking about, uh, but certainly within this department or within this specific category as well. So with that being said, Council, if uh, nobody has any other questions, I'd look for action on item 4.3. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, I would move to adopt an ordinance amending Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code to increase water and wastewater rates as indicated in Chapter 11. Second. Motion by Councilmember Mua, second by Councilmember Lohman, to adopt the ordinance amending Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code increasing water and wastewater rates. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Councilmember Mua, summary publication. I'd move to adopt a resolution directing summary publication of ordinance <clears throat> to increase water and wastewater rates. Motion by Councilmember Mua, second by Councilmember Martin for summary publication on item 4.3. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. We heard the presentation. We'll move right on to the uh, uh, public hearing for item 4.4, which is the public hearing for the ordinance to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.4? Mr. Sable, anyone on the line? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, no one new on the line. Last chance for anyone in the chambers? Council, no one coming forward for item 4.4, the public hearing on the ordinance to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Mua to close the public hearing on item 4.4. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? 
motion carries 6-0. Public hearing is closed. Council, any discussions on item 4.4? Solid waste and refuse collection fees? Hearing no questions, I'd look for action on item 4.4. Council, Council Member Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I move to adopt an ordinance amending Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees indicated in Chapter 11. Second. Motion by Council Member Mua, second by Council Member Lohman to adopt an ordinance amending Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees. No further council discussion on this? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Council Member Mua, summary publication. I think you would move to adopt a resolution directing summary publication of an ordinance to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees. Second. Motion by Council Member Mua, second by Council Member Carter for summary publication on item 4.4. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. And item 4.5, the resolution to, ch to uh, change stormwater charges. This is not a public hearing. We're back to our resolution as we bounce around here between our resolutions and our public hearings. This would be a resolution. Council, are, is there any further discussion on 4.5 regarding the change in stormwater charges? Council Member Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a really brief comment, um, kind of adding to what you had said early, earlier related to um, all of these charges, actually, or all of these um, items on the agenda. Uh, that we are um, currently voting on. Um, I just want to remind those in the public who might be watching that um, we have had hours and hours and hours of conversation about these um, increases. And so for those who are curious about what that discussion looked like, I really highly encourage them to go back and watch previous council meetings um, and discussions because, again, hours and hours of discussion around these. And it's not just, you know, I know during the campaign season there was the, you know, everything's a 7 or 6 0 vote. And, um, oftentimes it's because we spend so much time um, in these conversations. And so just wanted to say that out loud so that people don't think we're just up here approving without discussion. I appreciate that comment, Council Member Carter. And uh, please let me know if I move quickly, too quickly through some of these things. But by the same token, we literally, I think, are on our fourth discussion on a lot of these items and there is plenty of tape to back that up and so and, and good discussion but uh, we are to this point because of that discussion that we had and uh, the, the good discussions that we had between council with staff and um, and this is where we as I said this is where we ended up so thank you for that council any further discussion on item 4.5 the resolution to change stormwater charges hearing none I'd look for action on this resolution Councilmember Carter. I move to adopt a resolution establishing a basic system rate for the purpose of calculating stormwater drainage charges pursuant to section 16.15 of the city code. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Mua, adopting the resolution of establishing a basic system rate for the purpose of calculating stormwater drainage charges. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Item 4.6 is the resolution approving the 2024 utility fund budgets. Uh, Ms. Carlson, anything additional to add to this? Uh, Mayor, council members, nothing additional to add other than just a plug for the on the city's website. There's a city budget page, so it's right off the, the landing page, the home page for the city, so you can get the city budget. And uh, we have queued up all of the council meetings, all of the discussions, queued right up to that point, so you don't have to go searching um, with past council meetings, and you can see all of the presentations and all of the discussion there. Good. Thank you for making that clear to, for everyone. Council, any further discussion on the 2024 utility fund budgets? If not, uh, again, this is a resolution. I'd look for action on this resolution on item 4.6. Council Member Martin. Mayor, I will move that we adopt a resolution adopting the 2024 water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste enterprise fund budgets. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Carter, adopting the resolution to adopt the 2024 water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste enterprise fund budgets. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you very much, Ms. Carlson. Uh, thanks for your work over the past few months as we pulled all this together. Thanks for your work all summer, basically. Uh, I know you were the, the face of Bloomington in a lot of different events and uh, taking in the community engagement and the feedback and and uh, appreciate your willingness to do that and the ability that 
you do that, that, that you're able to do that and do it as effectively as you do, because uh, I think you're uh, a, a great representative for the city in so many different ways, but certainly as the face of the city, talking about sometimes difficult issues. And I, I know you do a fantastic job with that. So thank you. Thanks. Well done. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Moving on to item 4.7, our last item under four, our hearings, resolutions, our, excuse me, our, our hearings, ordinances, and uh, or resolutions. Thank you. I knew I had it right. I just had it in the wrong order. Uh, is item 4.7. This is also a public hearing, and this is uh, an ordinance regarding our Human Rights Commission. And uh, Ms. Manderscheid is going to lead us through this, and I think this is a... Uh, kind of an update and a cleanup to, to bring us up to speed and up to date in a lot of our language within our Human Rights Commission ordinance. Ms. Manderscheid. All right, thank you, Mayor and members. Uh, I am presenting tonight, although this is the uh, result of several people's work. Um, Amir uh, Malik, who you've met earlier this year, Peter Zuniga, uh, Faith Jackson, Eric Holthouse, Diane Kirby, uh, members of the Human Rights Commission. A lot of people have been engaged, Eric Coleman, in the process of reviewing these, the document before you tonight, as well as the city's fair housing policy that you acted on earlier tonight. Essentially, it's cleanup. Um, back in October, this body acted to approve uh, some updated bylaws for the Human Rights Commission. This ordinance uh, aligns the bylaw, or excuse me, aligns the ordinance with those bylaw updates, which by and large were to uh, update uh, the document to reflect what's actually happening, both with state law changes, state law words, uh, uh, department names, that sort of thing, as well as what sort of technically happens. Uh, all of our commissions, with the exception of the HRA, the Planning Commission, and the Port Authority, um, all of the other ones are advisor advisory to the City Council. And so that was one of the cleanup things that you saw happen. Uh, the other thing that is later on in the ordinance relates to contract uh, contractor compliance. And we made some edits to that section of the code um, in to clean up the process and shorten it. The process that was there was quite long, and we were of the opinion that we wouldn't want to wait and go through weeks and weeks of um, hearings and whatnot when we knew that um, we could take action much more quickly to address a, a human rights violation. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that there is a reference to uh, a 1970 uh, resolution with the school district, uh, and uh, we did some research on that and concluded that we did not want to wait to update this ordinance um, until we had a, a concurrent conversation with the school district. We anticipate that there will be a meeting such as that in 2024, and this would be placed on that agenda uh, for further discussion. I suspect that um, might be time to dust it off, um, but I could be wrong too. Uh, so um, I bring this before you for your consideration tonight. There's two actions. One is the ordinance, and uh, then the other one is the summary publication resolution. And I'm available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Mandershine. Council, questions on this? Councilmember Lohman. Um, you know, I did ask a question uh, earlier, and I, I didn't really get a response. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I guess my question I, I asked with regards to this ordinance change was with the process itself, if we actually did the process, would there be, you know, any liability risk if there was an error or an issue with respect to conducting that process, if we actually were doing that that process, Mayor members, Ms. Manderson, uh, Council uh, Council Member, uh, can you define the process that you're describing here? Well, the, the process that, uh, that I assume that we're eliminating here was the uh, uh, the ability of the Human Rights Commission to go out and uh, uh, advocate uh, for folks um, or or. Um, or, or work through issues, if, if I understand uh, the, the, what we're getting rid of here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Ms. Manderson. Mayor members, just a point of clarification. Um, Councilmember Lohman, are you referring to the edit um, to what is uh, subparagraph C um, in the top, uh, I guess it would be at the top of page two of the ordinance, um, or are you referring to the changes related to contractor compliance? 
Uh, I think it's C is what I'm looking for. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's C. I'm trying to get uh, there. Sure. So this is on the top of page two of the ordinance. Uh, we removed the reference to attempting to con conciliate within its authority and instead made a change to make it more clear that uh, what really happens um, from a practical perspective is that we're re referring those grievances to the state, essentially, or the federal law enforcement, depending upon what it is. Um, and so if there is something that needs action uh, right away, um, we would want to review, or excuse me, refer those items immediately uh, to the state human rights department or to the federal law enforcement or other, you know, relevant agency. Uh, this is um, a change that, as I understand it, is consistent with the bylaw change. Yeah, great. Uh, my question, though, is the liability piece. That's what I'm not getting. I get the process change, uh -huh. but was there with that process, if we were to execute it the way it's written? Answer the question, because as as much as I understand it, um, the history, it's never been used. So if you're, I could hypothesize as to possible. Well, let me, let me ask it this way. In other cities that actually do use that, is there any liability for the city if they do that? Uh, Mayor members, we reviewed the ordinances of lots of other cities that have human rights uh, commissions. Several cities have gotten rid of them altogether, or they have uh, enlarged their scope of authority to all civil rights. And for example, Minneapolis is much larger uh, in its scope. Um, it is not, I, I do not know about liability of other uh, human rights okay, commissions. That's, fair. That, that's all I need to know. Thanks. Thanks. Any Council other questions? Council, additional questions? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Manderton. Mm -hmm. Item 4.7 is a public hearing, and I will open this public hearing. This is a public hearing regarding the Human Rights Commission Ordinance. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.7 this evening? No one coming forward, Mr. Sable? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, no one on the line. Last call for anyone in the chambers to speak to item 4.7. Council, no one on the phone, no one coming forward in the chambers. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing at item 4.7. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing at item 4.7. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0, closing the public hearing at item 4.7. Council, any additional discussion on this? If not, I would look for action on item 4.7. Councilmember Lohman. Happy to make that motion. I move to approve an ordinance amending Chapter 2 of the City Code related to the Human Rights Commission and the contract compliance. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin, to approve the ordinance amending Chapter 2 of the City Code related to the Human Rights Commission and contract compliance. Any further council discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Councilmember Lohman, summary publication. Please. Mayor, I'll move to approve a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance amending Chapter 2 of the City Code related to the Human Rights Commission and contract compliance. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin for summary publication on item 4.7. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Ms. Manderscheid. Thanks for that cleanup. I appreciate it. And that wraps up item four on our agenda. We will move on to item five, our organizational business. And our first informational item is uh, item 5.1. This is regarding our business assistance program, our business continuum, our site and facade improvement program, our business retention program, and a partridge in a pear tree. And I think we've got a good portion of our Port Authority here to talk about this. Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Holly Masick. I am the Port Authority Administrator, and I'm here with my colleagues, Meredith Vanderwig, Barb Wolf, and Nick Johnson. Um, the Port Authority recently underwent significant organizational changes, expanding both its geography and the types of services offered. The Port Authority, which previously worked exclusively within South Loop, now offers economic development services citywide. The port has now has also added business assistance programs, primarily focused on small businesses, to the development and placemaking services already offered by our team. A new staff person position was created to serve as a liaison to the business community, and Barb Wolf joined the Port Authority in this role in 2023. The City of Bloomington began focusing more attention on small business support during COVID-19. As the city began looking for efficient ways to distribute federal relief funding, it found that it did not have an easy way to reach this important 
group of constituents. From there, the city began creating programs to develop relationships with and support small businesses, including developing the facade improvement and retention programs that you will hear about this evening. Small and large businesses play a vital role in supporting Bloomington's economy, as you all well know. They provide employment, contribute to the tax base, and support each other with local goods and services. In addition, small independent businesses contribute to Bloomington's uniqueness and sense of place. Got to get the next slide, please. I have the clicker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As the team in the Port Authority expands business assistance programs targeted at smaller businesses, it is important to understand that these programs will join a larger suite of services meant to assist Bloomington's businesses at every stage, from startup to expansion. This evening, I present to you Bloomington's business continuum, which shows the range of services available to businesses of all sizes that operate within the city. The business continuum is meant to be a living document which will grow and adjust as our community changes. The document shows business stages from startup to expansion and breaks down the programs we offer into three categories, information, connection, and promotion, grants, loans, and assistance, and technical assistance and consultation. Programs may grow out of different city departments and teams, and you'll hear about some today, or internal and external collaborations, but the Port Authority will work to ensure that they are cohesive, understood by our city colleagues, and promoted to our business community. It is also important to understand that the Port Authority is one entity in a wider regional team that supports Bloomington's economic development. External partners provide technical assistance and consultation to our businesses, help amplify our message, to their own audiences, offer loans and grants, and collaborate on regional business attraction efforts. So in greater detail, what we have here, and I apologize, this one is dense, but looking from small businesses to large businesses across the top, and small businesses to us are technically fewer than 500 employees, but in Bloomington, we're primarily focused on employees with fewer than 50. We're working with them from left to right, from ideation and startup to early stage and launching, to operating, growing, and expanding and relocating here. You'll see down the left, Bloomington is providing a number of services, and then we lean on our partners for others. In the top band of Bloomington services, we have information, connection, and promotion. We have a program called Welcoming Wednesdays, which invites our business community to come into City Hall and speak to a consultant of ours. We're working on developing a small business center, which should open next year. We have a growing business resource newsletter, newsletter where we can share resources for the business community. Barb Wolf works on assisting businesses with permitting process that can be complicated and intimidating to a new business. We do often across community development talk to different businesses about site selection and broker referral as they look for specific sites. Our communications team works closely with us to promote businesses in the community. We are proactively performing business retention visits now, going to visit both small, small businesses as well as large businesses. We offer business networking with a number of partners, including our regional chamber. Hatch Bloomington, you heard about recently, which is a new competitive pitch program. And then we have the Workforce Bloomington Steering Committee led by our mayor, which includes educational institutions and large businesses. Moving down to grants, loans, and incentives, You'll hear about the site and facade improvement program tonight, as well as the retention program. We have SAC credit and deferral that was developed during COVID. We have a business subsidy program. We help many large businesses with state, county, and federal grants. And then we have financial programs like tax increment financing that we use as well. And finally, we do lean a lot on partners for technical assistance and consultation. There are so many resources available in the area. And so two popular ones that we use are Open to Business, which is run by the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers, and Elevate Hennepin by Hennepin County that refers to free consulting. And then Hennepin also runs several cohort programs for new and expanding businesses, and Bloomington and Brooklyn Park are actually pilot locations for the newest one, which is CEO Start, and you'll hear more about that in the end of this year and the beginning of next year. And with that, I will turn it over to Nick Johnson, Senior Planner, to talk about our site and facade improvement programs. Thanks, Holly. Community Mayor members, 
Uh, so happy to present to you an uh, informational update about our proposed site and facade improvement uh, program. So first of all, just why uh, pursue a program like this? You may often hear about them more in kind of historic downtowns or other areas that are trying to achieve kind of a uniform aesthetic. Uh, but the more we talked about it uh, at CD Re, which is where these discussions really launched between, as a collaboration between planning staff and port staff, uh, was that there really is uh, um, kind of a missing link of programming that you can offer small businesses, many of which are um, uh, buyback and women owned um, uh, tools in order to improve their sites. And historically, Bloomington has uh, done some larger redevelopment projects of some commercial nodes. But what we felt was kind of missing is kind of that uh, lower uh, hang fruit tool or that smaller um, uh, uh, tool in order to improve sites uh, from their current condition without uh, the, the kind of the hardship or some of the difficulty that can result from full redevelopment. So that's kind of what made us look towards this. And of course, we know that uh, some of our aging commercial nodes have been a longstanding priority of both this council and council's past. So that's why we look to this program. Um, in terms of purpose, really just straightforward, just to enhance the physical environment and uh, the building aesthetics of commercial nodes in Bloomington. So uh, I, you, know, you can kind of look at some of these key purpose statements on the screen, uh, but really what your, uh, the key connection is, what are the eligible activities? Um, and that's really what the purpose is. It's to improve the vibrancy of these spaces, uh, to create uh, opportunities for activation and more uh, you know, pedestrian connections, patios, um, but also just improving the buildings themselves. Just getting to the basics of uh, how it's uh, put together, um, uh, the minimum grant amount would be a $5,000 uh, grant with a maximum uh, award of $25,000. This would be a one-to-one -one match. Uh, so part of the um, um, part of the play here is also to in incentivize uh, investment and improvement of, of sites by property owners and tenants. Um, uh, I will note that related to the money, I'm not really the money guy, but uh, the related to the money, uh, we got some good news that Hennepin County um, is going to award Bloomington with a $35,000 grant uh, to help launch uh, this program and help uh, build the budget. So that was exciting news that we got. Uh, Barb Wolf was heavily involved in that. Um, get into the eligible expenses. Uh, you know, I'm not going to rattle off the list, but uh, hopefully what we're keying in on is things that we think make a difference in order to improve the vibrancy and the um, aesthetic conditions of some of these sites. Um, and uh, what it's really not intended to do is just do general maintenance. Um, so I think the staff will have some uh, just general discretion to ensure that it's really uh, kind of furthering that purpose and intent uh, as shown in the policy. So I mentioned uh, ineligible activities, routine maintenance, uh, parking lot improvements, some of the things that other uh, you know, uh, properties, which are costly, no doubt, but uh, don't further that purpose. Uh, we have been doing some engagement. Certainly we did the online engagement piece like we typically do, uh, but um, myself and several other staff have been out door knocking some of these uh, commercial sites. And what we're focused on is the B2 and B4 zone sites. Those are our neighborhood commercial uh, zone sites where all of the uh, eight priority nodes are located, but, are, but other commercial properties in Bloomington. And uh, I will say that they were very uh, appreciative and excited just to be talking to city staff about this program, um, because I think often, as I mentioned, I think the city's uh, efforts have been focused maybe a little bit more on redevelopment uh, in the past. So they were excited about this, um, uh, and that's important too, uh, but they were, they were happy to speak with us. Um, so I think that we will get some applications. Um, Oops. Yeah, so we did, yeah, I knew it. <laughs> we did do an REIA on this. Uh, we found that there was no um, unintended uh, negative consequences kind of resulting from this policy. And in fact, supporting small business uh, is also uh, a means to support um, uh, BIPOC and women-owned businesses in Bloomington. Um, you know, the, the better these sites feel, the, the more successful those businesses are gonna be at, at uh, attracting new patrons and new customers. So uh, we were pleased with that. And then just in terms of general alignment, uh, of course, if you want to uh, create a remarkable uh, city to live in, uh, then you need to create remarkable places. And we think that this is gonna be a tool that helps do that. Um, and then of course, one of the BTT priorities is equitable economic growth. As I mentioned, we think uh, that this project will help uh, businesses at these priority sites. Um, through the administration of this program. So it's kind of a pilot. Uh, the port, I think, is committed to reviewing it on an annual basis to see how effective it is. 
Um, but this is kind of the kickoff. So happy to take any questions, but otherwise I'm going to pass it off to Meredith Vandewig. Cool. Questions at all? Council Member Nelson? Um, yeah, I got a couple quick questions. Um, how exactly is this funded other than the, we got the grant from Hennepin County? Will it be the port levy or other port levy? Mayor, that's uh, Councilor Nelson. That's correct. Okay. Um, the uh, two questions I have in terms of the the this program. How do we ensure that the money goes to the small business for updates? Because I look at a lot of these commercial nodes, and I looked at the one in my district, and um, I mean the economic or the price, the market value of it's by like two point three million dollars. This is not necessarily a really small business that owns it um and we're going to be giving them significant amount of money from the levy uh to help update that yet there are other parts of this that go towards signage and things like that that would be used by the small businesses that are tenants how do we ensure that the money goes to the small business and not frankly a larger entity property owner that in all likelihood may not need the money and I don't begrudge them for being successful in owning property. That's, that's great. I just don't know that our money should be used to incentivize them. So that's, that's my first question. Then I have one other one. Yeah. Mayor Councilor Nelson and I, I welcome port staff to um, speak to how they'll administrate and administer it um, uh, eventually. But um, I think one of the ways you do that is you uh, allow tenants to apply. I mean, they do need to seek property owner. It is the property owner's okay. building. So you do want to empower them to apply as tenants. Um, that's one way that you do that. Another way is that you uh, do the engagement with tenants as opposed to just mailing it off to property owners and those types of things. So, um, and you know, and Barb and Holly, other port staff who engage with businesses a lot, they're, they're already promoting this as a means to do some of those things. So I, I recognize that concern uh, definitely does exist. Um, as far as other eligibility criteria, maybe that's something we have. We've talked about those things, but they always do have a legal component as well. Yeah. Um, so, but yes, I think it's how you get the word out and how you who you encourage to apply and and some of those things. Yeah, just don't talk to legal. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my second question is. Um, in some ways, is this counterproductive to some of our other goals? We have talked about and done a lot with commercial neighborhood nodes and have talked about a concept of redevelopment in terms of newer formats where we have the parking lots in the back of them, similar to what has happened at Old Shakopee and uh, France Avenue and some other places. I mean, we did the in, you know Lindale retrofit with that goal in mind is incentivizing people to update these spaces counterproductive to redevelopment in the long term? Yeah, Mayor Councilman Nelson, I think you definitely want to keep an eye on that. Um, uh, the one thing I'd say, um, having worked on you know some of these commercial nodes in the past, is that sometimes when it is kind of an all or nothing, you're setting the bar pretty hard or pretty high uh, to make that project go. Obviously, you need willing participants, either sellers and or uh, people who want to take that full-blown um, uh, that project of that magnitude and they have if they have you know good occupancy rates sometimes it's just not going to occur if they're uh, getting good revenue uh, from the building so um, it's not to say that that approach isn't definitely uh, um, warranted in some locations and would meet other city goals. We just think adding this tool in the toolbox would be beneficial. And there's a lot of properties not in those priority nodes where I think that more significant intervention that you're talking about um, would also benefit um, along Lindale and other places. So, yeah. Councilmember Lohman. If I can kind of pick up right where... Councilmember Nelson uh, left off because <clears throat> I, I saw with one of these purposes being that to provide tools and strategies in support of small businesses that are displaced due to redevelopment. Did that is that still a part of this program or did I miss that? Or oh, is that the next one? Okay, I'm ahead of myself here. Okay, I'm way ahead of myself. Okay, okay. so then let me ask my other questions then. Okay, I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so then you know we have these these. Um, uh, these purposes that we have for this particular program. My question is, what does success look like when uh, you know we're said and done, and we've we've invested all this money, um, you know, in, in these uh, particular project projects? I know that you mentioned that there'd be some evaluations, and I have some. That's my kind of my secondary question is around how we're going to evaluate that. But you know, as a policymaker, 
you know, here are the purposes that you've got laid out here. How do I know what success looks like? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it certainly on some, uh, hopefully, uh, the pro the uh, program is going to support projects that look and make these sites function and feel better. Um, so that's one piece of it. Uh, the second piece is certainly you can look, I mean, it's going to take years to figure some of that out, but if the overall performance of some of those multi-tenant spaces improve and just from an occupancy or rent standpoint, certainly our assessing staff uh, look at those things, that would be another way to evaluate how uh, this project has incentivized some investment. Um, and um, uh, I, I thought maybe, Councilmember Nelson, you might ask me about just the amount of money. Obviously, construction is very costly right now. How far does $50,000 or twenty five in terms of the ma major grant go? But if it's just that little extra added push uh, mm -hmm. to kind of get something going um, at a site, we think that that's uh, really beneficial. Um, so we're going to measure it just in terms of the amount of projects. If we're actually using these funds on an annual basis, it's making projects go that otherwise would not, and we can talk to people about that. Um, uh, that, that'll be the real test. And as I said, they will look at it on an annual basis. Okay. And then, um, finally, um, in terms of the application process, um, there's renewed scrutiny, uh, in the community around, uh, you know, people applying for things, uh, has staff at all looked at, um, what that application process looks like and, and how, um, and I'm not necessarily looking for an answer today, but has that been a part of the discussion in terms of, you know, how that application process looks like and, you know, what, you know how folks move their way through that process. Uh, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, it has been a discussion internal to staff. Uh, we originally started with a very grandiose scoring uh, system and criteria with an open application window with award at the end of the year. But after talking to the uh, Minneapolis Regional Chamber and other entities that kind of administer these types of programs, uh, they impressed upon us that being able to be nimble and fast is actually really important in a lot of these circumstances because if you can get, uh, if some of these improvements help a business get established, but that time window can be eight or six, six or eight weeks of time in order to make something go. Uh, so one thing they impressed upon us is not to do a, um, a, a kind of rigid scoring criteria that all meets uh, or all is decided at either one or two points of the year. Um, so that's one thing, an easier application process. Um, that's something we did focus on. So we did, we went away from the kind of the grandiose scoring criteria. And I, and I will say, I appreciate that, you know, I and also think there's some equity components of that too. That may, mm -hmm. But one thing I would want to want to just as advice is just in terms of being able to, we're able to explain our process and, and in terms of, I know we you know, talk about transparency and that kind of thing. And so the decision making is very clear in terms of how that's made and we can kind of, you know, leg that out and make it make sense uh, so that folks don't feel like there's some kind of special advantage or that kind of thing. And I know the staff is going to take care of that. So again, not looking for just, I want to make sure I stated that. No, thank you. I welcome that comment for sure. Council member Martin. Thank you, Mayor. I, sorry, we almost kept cruising and then we opened up the questions. And it was, I, I asked for it. It's okay. <laughs> um, I apologize. This might be kind of an elementary question. I guess, especially when you're talking about uh, code deficiency of sites, are we anticipating the code deficiencies we're seeing out in the community? I'm picturing, say, uh, kind of a tired strip mall. Are those deficiencies largely the responsibilities of the owner at this point, or are we seeing a lot of deficiencies that would be, say, an individual business's signage in that larger strip mall? I'm just trying to picture, especially when it comes to, to code stuff, who's responsible for most of what we're seeing out there right now. Yeah, Mayor, Council Member Martin, uh, the property owner is responsible uh, yep. to deal with that ultimately at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah. That makes sense. And, and, and just getting back to, I know I've, I've mentioned it way back in the past, but maybe a conversation for next year again, uh, because in my conversations with environmental health, when it comes to code deficient businesses, uh, from what I understand, the strictures that state law puts on, say, our fine structure that we can levy against businesses that are consistently out of compliance, and it being a low enough amount where some businesses just work it into their business model and write the check time and time again. So I, I'm tremendously excited about this program and appreciate the work. Uh, just want to make sure that we have an adequate, if we've got this good of a carrot, we should probably have a more functional stick too. So. Thank you. Thank you. No additional questions. Let's press I'm, on. I'm still here. I'll be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got it for me. Good evening, council members, mayor. Um, tonight I'm going to present to you our business retention program. 
So why this program? It is important to note, very similar to Nick's facade improvement, that this originated from the CD REIT work plan of 2022 and 2023. Um, in the summer of 2022, we came to you in City Council to let you know about our initiatives, what was on our work plan, and one of the things that one of our subcommittees was working on was doing some research into displacement and anti-displacement policies and how those might fit into the City of Bloomington. So, um, as many of our small businesses are underserved, businesses are in aging business nodes, and this retention program would strive to be a tool, um, both financially to support when these uh, locations would look to redevelopment. Um, in this case, we did not engage with the public on this policy, um, mostly because it was important that we knew that this was a benefit. We don't have anything like this in the city to support displacement for commercial businesses, so we saw that as a plus. We also wanted to make sure that in some of these conversations, when you're mentioning relocation to displacement, uh, if we brought that to the public, it might be perceived that there could be a project already underhand, and we didn't want to give the misconception um, or undue concern. So the purpose for this is to better ensure that we continue to cultivate a diverse and vibrant business community. This program would provide a path to maintain these businesses within Bloomington city limits um, with initial financial options when facing displacement and relocation. So we want to make sure that we're supporting um, these small businesses. Program requirements. Um, so for those who would like to apply for this, it would be an online application. Um, they'd have to follow the preceding steps. Um, in this case, the intent and hope for this would be a one-year forgivable loan um, so that if you do apply for this, you do get the either minimum amount of 5000 or maximum amount of 15000 per borrower. borrower. Um, if you are able to retain in your new location within those 12 months, um, you could have this be forgivable. Um, the funds would be on a first-come, first-served basis. Some of the eligible expenses for this could, would include the following that are listed here. As many know, permit fees are expenses. It could help with lease payments, infrastructure improvements. Um, so removing or relocation, relocating could be quite expensive. Ineligible expenses would include some of the following, your accounts payable, inventory costs, or direct business-related bills would be some of the few that we would not include in these expenses or eligible. Our racial equity impact assessment was done, um, and that uh, similar to Nick's, that we found that this would only be a benefit to our community. Um, there's nothing like this currently in any of our city programs, and we felt we'd be continuing to uplift our small businesses. So the research that we did seemed like this would be a benefit to those in our small business community. In alignment with our citywide plans and priorities, um, we believe it aligns with our Bloomington Tomorrow Together. It helps with that equitable uh, economic growth, public relations, communications, and marketing strategy. We're there to help in, uh, advance our business advocates and our business community. And our Port Authority Economic Development five-year plan, this directly speaks to the retention portion and the expansion of that plan. Do you have any questions directly for this program? Questions, Council? Council Member Loman. Get this thing turned on. So um, I see that there's a forgivable loan slash grant. Why not a grant? Why a loan? Um, yeah. Um, so we were advised to call this uh, a loan in this case versus a grant. The intent being that if we were we're going to give these funds up front. So um, unlike the matching plan of the facade improvement, these would be given to those um, to reclose relocate it immediately. Um, it would be considered like a loan at first. Once they supply themselves with a signed lease within the city of Bloomington and those city limits, if they can maintain staying in that location within the 12 months of that loan disbursement, um, it would be then forgivable. So the hope is that we're helping get our small businesses over the hump of that relocation, staying in Bloomington, um, and you know maintaining a thriving business to the you know the best of our ability to support that relocation. Um, so the hope was to make sure that this money got into their hands right away went to the process of moving and relocating um, and hopefully a cost that they, they could have forgiven at the end of the day as long as they stay in Bloomington. 
Is there any concern at all in terms of the health of any of these businesses in terms of they, or will that be handled uh, through the application process? Part of that will be in our application process. Um, at first, uh, we will be making sure that they're qualified. So we're only looking at small businesses. That would be 50 full-time people or less with under $2 million in revenue. So we'd be making sure that this isn't going to a larger business who would uh, utilize these funds to uh, relocate incorrectly. Um, and then from there, it would be on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, so it would be dependent on how many other applicants would be applying at this time. Um, if you're looking at a commercial node where several could be relocating, um, that could be a little bit more based on a timing aspect of who's applying first. Uh, so that we're not necessarily looking at the viability of the business necessarily when the, they're applying, or are, are we? We are. We're definitely looking at commercial nodes. That would be a priority in this program, um, and we would be looking at the business itself. Um, but as long as it does meet the minimum criteria, we would be looking at that as a potential viable loan. All right, last question for you. And then, um, and since this is a grant, how are we going to sustain this for the long term? Um, so our hope is to start off with some small seed money to see where this comes. Um, at the maximum here is 15000 so we are going to be taking 45000 for our first run at this program as a pilot program. Uh, this is one of those uh, programs that may not be used for a period of time. Uh, this would be volunteer uh, redevelopment. So we're waiting on someone to develop where then someone can no longer retain their lease in that location. There may be many times there isn't a need for it, and then there may be times where a larger, older commercial node um, would be you know, redeveloping and we could need more funds. So the hope is to build on this year by year and eventually add more to our funds. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, mine's more of a comment. The one thing I really want to see <clears throat> come back, uh, especially if, as I've been out just hearing you know, some of the challenges and hurdles that businesses run into as we go through these, I really want to understand what are the common themes that are coming up that these businesses are, are sharing with us mm. so that we can understand what those are and, and put things in place to help alleviate those hurdles so that these can be more effective as we move forward. So that's something I definitely want to see come back. Thank you, Councilmember. Any other questions, Council? Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Is, is there anyone next, or is that? That's it. That is it. Very good. <laughs> if you do have any additional questions for any of us, we are happy to take them. Very good. Uh, Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So you showed that beautiful slide of the business continuum, and I liked the detailed version. <laughs> um, is that going to be on our website soon? Are we going to be promoting that among the business community? Certainly we will be. We need to do a little bit more tweaking of it. But as I said during the presentation, it's meant to be a living document. So, okay. um, And then I will uh, build off of something that Council Member Mua said, um, and I, I know this comes up in conversations frequently when we talk about small businesses in Bloomington and I so I know staff are having conversations about um, any kind of um, issues whether it's related to our code or other things uh, that might make it harder for small businesses in Bloomington um, and um, and so I just I, I don't know can you talk more about is there is there going to be kind of a more formal strategy developed or are you just kind of documenting things as you go and then trying to figure out you know, is this a reoccurring theme and are we going to do something about it? I guess I feel like it comes up frequently and so I, I'm wondering um, what staff is thinking as um, a process to move forward with taking in that kind of input and figuring out um, through that assessment if there are some key themes that, that would inform some policy discussions for us. Yes, Council Member Carter, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, that is the exact right question to ask. I think right now we're working out what type of cadence would be appropriate for that and I know there are other teams that have been looking at this as well so right now just initially we were thinking every six months of bringing together everybody who works permitting BNI etc with small businesses and hearing that feedback and seeing what types of policy changes we might need to make also these programs are meant to be reviewed annually to make sure they're still relevant if we need to change some of the application processes or requirements as well. So I do think I would prefer to have a regular cadence at which we do this so that, you know, we don't hear something, then it sort of slides aside over time. 
Thank you. Um, and I think from a council perspective, it's also super helpful to be able to um, I mean, just kind of have a, a shared understanding of the types of policies that we are working on that are in support of small businesses and, and businesses in general. So I think about the sign policy discussion that we're going to have later tonight, right? Like that was really um, uh, the language in our code has been very tricky for staff and for people in the business community, I assume. And so um, just things that we are uh, working on collectively to help um, address some of the issues that we have heard about and then continuing to document those and work towards solutions. Thank you. And thank you for your comments, uh, Council Member. And so the uh, Holly just kind of briefly touched on the, the, the Workforce Development Committee work that we've been doing. And as, as we've come to the end of our work, it, looking at possibilities for, for subcommittees and work products and what we really want to accomplish. And actually, a, a lot of what we've talked about in that group really do dovetail very nicely into the work that's going on at staff level and, and at other places within here at City Hall. Um, the telling, to, telling Bloomington's story is one of the things that was identified with this group and, and marketing Bloomington in a special way. And we continue to talk about that. I mean, obviously here we see the public relations, communications, and marketing strategic plan. We know we're working on it at the city level. Uh, we've got the subcommittee talking about it. So you have to bring all that work together. But then also a discussion on removing barriers for, for business just in general. And not just at the staff level, as, as, as Holly was saying, not just to bring the staff together and put their heads together, but to actually to get out and talk to small business owners and have them say, well, you know, this is kind of an issue that we might want to address. And, and to be able to do that on a recurring and consistent basis and to have that feedback loop, not just be, not just be a sounding board, but to actually then work through some of those issues, I think is an incredibly important part of all of this. So I agree with you completely. And I think, uh, I, I know we've got at least a couple of different um, wheels in motion in terms of this and I hope we can accomplish what exactly what you're talking about in terms of removing those barriers. So. Anything else council? Very good. Well, thank you. I appreciate Mr. it. Mr. Mayor. And as council member Carter threw the teaser out for our next item, item 5.2, our Second part of our discussion on our sign ordinance study. Welcome back. Thank you. Oop, oop, careful now. Sorry. Static Thank you, electricity Mayor. will get you every time. Should have learned that one by now. <laughs> uh, forgive me here. I'm just going to share my slides briefly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, the study session before you this evening, uh, Mayor and members, is uh, to present our new draft sign code. Uh, a couple points about that. The document that was in your packet uh, represents all of the new content that would repla effectively replace the existing sign code. Uh, what I would say it does not include is the multitude of cross-references and all of the other um, uh, kind of ordinances or sections of the city code that refer to the sign code. Um, after kind of debating it internally in terms of what the best approach was, we decided that in order to build, in order to kind of give us the best chance going forward, it was best to build consensus on uh, the draft new sign code before tying and weaving all of the other uh, connective joints and tissue of the city code into this document in the preparation of a formal ordinance. I just wanted to make that point. Um, and so what are we looking for tonight? What we're looking for is a discussion about whether or not we think that this uh, new sign code is ready for a formal public hearing process. Is it advanced along enough and is it meeting kind of uh, the vision um, for how Bloomington wants to regulate signage uh, and go forward? Um, I, I would just add a note that we did this same exercise with Planning Commission on November 16th and it was uh, a good discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of share the same thing with you that I will with them. We've even condensed this down just a little bit more for you, uh, given the nature of your agendas. Uh, but, you know, there's 35 pages in the new draft sign code. The existing one is 79, so I still uh, think it's an improvement. Uh, I wish it was shorter uh, than it was. Um, but uh, in this presentation, I'm not going to go into every uh, section of the draft code, but I will be happy to um, answer your questions about specific elements uh, if, if uh, there are some. So just getting into a, an agenda here just for this study session, here's some of the topics. 
I just want to go over, I want to provide a quick uh, background um, component, just reiterate the project goals, give you a short update about the legal review of the existing and the draft code, uh, provide you some insight into some of the public engagement activities we've been doing, and then just do an overview of some of the key elements of the new draft signed code. And then we'll just wrap up with uh, our proposed timeline and next steps uh, for this project. So in terms of uh, why we are here, of course, the signed code is on the, the Planning Commission work plan. It's been a target to update it for a few years now. Um, the existing signed code was created in 1996. We talked, I may have mentioned that in January when we were last uh, together talking about this topic. Um, uh, in the, the period uh, following that um, uh, engagement session and around that timeline, we did engage with signed installers. So we have continued to speak with some signed installers uh, throughout our drafting process. Uh, and we also uh, did a survey and engagement with uh, several local jurisdictions, some of whom have recently updated their signed standards. In fact, I've learned that a few more cities are working on this, probably for some of the same legal reasons um, uh, with uh, uh, Kate, recent case law and whatnot. So I anticipate more cities to be working on this in the coming uh, year or two. So, and then just to reiterate, we did a study session in January. That's when we did the polling exercise. Um, I just want to reiterate that those uh, activities were uh, mainly used to, to try and delineate or build uh, or figure out where we had broad uh, consensus among the Planning Commission and Council. Uh, we did have some uh, instances of kind of close tie votes and things like that. Um, so where we, had, where we had clear consensus, we certainly drove in those directions where it was a little bit uh, a little bit more uh, mixed. Um, we had to kind of use some best judgment calls based on best practices and research and other things. I'll try and identify those things. Just in terms of research methods of what informed the draft code, it's really a wide collection. We're trying to take, take what's best of what's local, the best of some national examples that have been pointed to us, and then also there's a number of different model ordinances that we've kind of pulled from. And not all of those are going to align well with what Bloomington's uh, like land use mix is or kind of what our community character is or kind of what the aesthetics here are. So we kind of have to um, uh, pull together elements of different uh, sources uh, and put it together in something that we think uh, makes sense um, uh, for Bloomington. Okay. I presented this same slide to you uh, previously in January. This, these project goals have not changed. This is still the three measuring sticks that we are uh, testing the different policy decisions when we're debating certain uh, standards internally with staff. Uh, these are kind of the three things that we look at. Does it conform with current legal standards? Does it improve clarity, reduce the complexity of this ordinance? And does it improve the organization uh, formatting and user experience? Those are the three things that we really try and stress. I mentioned the overall reduction in content. So the new sign code is over 50% um, uh, shorter. Uh, hopefully it's laid out in a much more uh, sensical manner and that people are not going to be kind of doing keyword searches and uh, trying to use a magic trick to figure out what type of sign or uh, how big it can be. Um, allowed at their property. So hopefully uh, we feel like it's been laid out in uh, a pretty logical way uh, based on a model ordinance recommended by our um, uh, contracted legal counsel in, in that instance. Um, so I think uh, hopefully we're moving in the right direction in all three of these categories. Just to give you an update about the legal elements, Kevin Toski is here um, uh, this evening from the, the legal department, of course, Melissa. But um, uh, and this project has been a little bit different um, from uh, some other typical community development ordinances or planning projects in that the legal department, because of the, the complexity and nature of this project, they are uh, basically a co-author uh, in, this, in this project. So uh, Kevin's helped me draft uh, large sections of the, the new sign code. Um, and I'm very appreciative of that help. Um, but so uh, it's just really important that they are there to review kind of those content uh, neutrality and other legal elements uh, of these provisions. And so in support of that, uh, as I mentioned back in January, we did contract with a nationally recognized legal expert in this regard, John Baker with Green Espel. Uh, so he has reviewed our existing uh, sign code and kind of identified it all the landmines or red flags uh, for us with current case law. Um, and uh, we have sent him the new uh, draft sign code, and we anticipate him to return his comments to us in December. Um, so we're moving in the right direction uh, in that regard. In terms of engagement process, um, uh, the, because the sign code touches on so many different internal uh, departments and divisions within the city, we've actually done a lot of internal <laughs> engagement, uh, frankly, because every different department and division at the city 
uh, interacts with the sign standards in different ways. Parks and Rec, for example, has a lot of different facilities that they have signage for. Um, uh, police and fire have public safety interests in, in some of these provisions, like addressing and other things. Um, uh, the city clerk just went through an election process. I'm sure there's lots of signs out in the community for that type of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a process that many different people are involved with. Um, in terms of the internal engage, uh, ex, uh, excuse me, external engagement, really dealing with uh, direct engagement. I want to emphasize that as much as we can, both with groups and individuals. Of course, there's a lots of different trade associations or uh, um, organizations that represent various interests. So we've been uh, talking with the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. I actually just met with them the other day. And when they included our sign ordinance in their draft uh, email blast out to all their members, that was appreciated on their part. Um, the Minnesota Retailers Association, the Shopping Center Association, the Industrial and Office Properties, uh, Commercial Real Estate Association. So we've been working with all these groups. They're all aware of our effort to do this. Uh, but in addition to that, we also uh, regularly interact with a lot of uh, Bloomington property owners, some of whom um, own and operate you know, various commercial and industrial buildings. And every chance we get, we let them know, hey, we're working on this. Some choose to engage, some don't, and that's fine. Um, but they're on our list as well. Um, and then just various individuals, um, uh, whether they be architects working on behalf of a client or uh, just other uh, property owners with interest in the sign code, um, uh, we've got uh, we've grown a good uh, list of ongoing contacts. And then, of course, our online engagement page, we have been uh, utilizing that as well, had decent traffic uh, on it, and it's picked up a little bit lately, so that's good. Um, in terms of uh, sign types, so this is where I'm going to, get into specific topics with the new sign code. Um, and the, the things that I kind of highlight in bold, uh, I suppose that's kind of my subtle nudge to try and maybe solicit more direct uh, feedback from you to make sure that we're pointed in the right direction. Um, but you're gonna see in the new sign code, we, we try and utilize and implement uh, tables wherever we can when you're kind of laying out lots of uh, information. So this looks very similar to the, if you're familiar with the use table in the city zoning code, which identifies all the allowed uses by zoning district, this is very much a similar approach. Um, so at the top, you can see we have different sign districts. The current sign code has eight of these. We've can consolidate that down into five sign districts, basically. Um, and what this table is laying out for you, what are all the different sign types that are allowed within these different sign districts? So it should be fairly straightforward or um, uh, should be uh, more predictable in terms of uh, people able, uh, being able to locate this information. We have removed some obsolete sign types, so some of the complexity we deal with is uh, they either have two very similar sign types that they're kind of uh, confusing or it's just unnecessary. It just adds uh, unnecessary complexity to this document and um, uh, makes it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, in terms of uh, building signs, one thing I do want to touch on is that when we did the polling exercise, we talked about uniformity of construction. So as I mentioned, some cities do require, and particularly in multi-tenant situations, that uh, sign types across a, uh, across a multi-tenant building all have the same construction type. And as a reminder, there's two basic building type uh, um, types of signs. There's cabinet signs, which are a uh, generic general shape, square or a triangle or whatever with the lit cabinet typically. And then there's the channel cut construction, which is individual letters and symbols um, uh, put together. So our current code has a uniformity of construction uh, sign type. This was an area in the polling exercise that Planning Commission and City Council were both uh, pretty split on. It wasn't There wasn't clear marching orders to go in one direction or the other. Um, I would say that the staff, the draft before you does not include a uniformity of construction uh, requirement, and there's several reasons for that, um, not just having to do with the project goals of uh, adding complexity and those things, but planning staff in terms of when we've interacted with a lot of sign installers and building owners, and there's several downstream things that can happen with uniformity of construction. One is there's certain businesses whose logos or branding don't marry well with one sign type or the other. So eventually, uh, not often, but in some cases, it can cause uh, kind of some uh, problems for those business owners in terms of manuf or fabricating the sign of their choosing that they want on their site. The second reason is that uh, a lot of private property owners actually implement their very own signage requirements at their multi-tenant sites. So it's something that we think is happening more effectively um, uh, between the private parties as, as they sign leases, as they uh, establish their businesses in Bloomington. That's one piece of it. 
Another piece of it is that it adds an extra layer of uh, regulatory complexity. Uh, we have we require all multi-tenant sites to have what's called uniform sign designs, where we establish at every building that has more than one tenant what the sign construction has to be. Those documents have to be tracked over time, updated over time. Staff has to reference them. The sign installers need to review them. It just adds another extra layer. Uh, the fourth thing, uh, just from an equity perspective, channel cut signs are much more costly than cabinet signs in many cases. Um, and so when you're requiring uniformity of construction in some cases, uh, you know, a sign that was, say, $5,000 to manufacture now becomes 10. Those are just, you know, generic numbers. Um, I'm not referencing a specific quote of recent uh, time, but I'm saying that there is a, there's a downstream impact to that. Um, uh, which, which we find some difficulty with. And then finally, just uh, from a perspective, you know, if you look at, read through all the purpose statements about the sign code, what it's intended to do, it is intended to manage visual clutter, it is intended to prevent harm to the physical environment, those types of things. Uh, but what we're trying to do is put a test of public peace, safety, health, uh, welfare to a lot of these regulations that we're putting together for signage. And that's one uh, that we think kind of veers closer more to the aesthetics um, uh, lane than it does on uh, kind of protecting the peace, health, safety, welfare piece of it. So that's just our piece. We, and that, it's not to say that you can't do that. Uh, a lot of cities do uh, uh, go that route. I just want to give you the, the unvarnished staff uh, perspective on this. Um, signage allowances. So uh, if you recall, another thing that we did during this polling exercise was to evaluate whether or not we felt that the amount of signage in most situations in Bloomington was appropriate for the development types uh, that we have here. And there was good consensus on that. I think both groups were very supportive of the signage allowances uh, that we established. And so um, uh, we took that guidance and we reviewed and evaluated a lot of uh, recent sign permits that we had reviewed and we put it through the test of our new sign code. One way that the new sign code is different than the existing sign code is that we actually utilize lot frontage and building uh, or tenant space frontage um, as a means to establish the amount of signage that they're allowed. And the reason that we do that is that these are two pieces of information that are much more readily available for all properties in Bloomington, as opposed to always having detailed, uh, say, elevation uh, plans of every building, architectural plans in effect. So on the screen before you on the image is just an example. I think we had the same image in our January slide, but knowing that a building tenant space is 75 feet wide is a much easier thing to calculate and know with certainty as opposed to if you have incomplete architectural drawings and basing signage on a um, percentage of wall area. So again, getting back to those project goals, less complexity, more consistency, we just think this is a much better approach. Um, the what this means of how we actually determine the amount of signage is based on multiplication factors. So I'll show you that when it comes to both freestanding and building signage. Um, uh, but basically what those are intended to meet is still to accommodate and provide the appropriate amount of signage for 90 to 95% of the situations of what you see in Bloomington. There are outliers. I can think of a few buildings. I don't want to name them or list their addresses that have maybe uh, very uh, large signs beyond what might be appropriate, but um, uh, basically what we think is that you're not gonna create a lot of nonconformity is kind of the key there with some of these ratios that we're recommending. So getting to an example of that, so freestanding signs, similar to my comment about sign types, we're really trying to consolidate all this information into a table. So here you've got the number of signs allowed, setbacks, the maximum height of the signs, and then the area of the signs broken down by all these uh, sign districts here. And so um, some sign districts will retain just having a flat amount of freestanding signage, like say for a place of assembly in the class one district or a multifamily building in the class two district, those kind of remain the same. Um, but in our class, what would be the new class three district, um, which is where the majority of our commercial and industrial properties are located, what we're talking about doing is going to a frontage uh, calculation with a maximum, with a cap, basically. Um, and uh, where we landed for that is 0.4. Uh, we also are providing larger sign heights and allowances under certain circumstances along the, the, the freeway, I-94, um, I'm sorry, 494, 35W, and uh, 77. So there is some consideration of that element, which is um, something that uh, we had to put together through consolidating some of these sign districts. Um, 
And uh, the, the other thing I'll say about this too is with the current sign code, by having a flat amount for every property, if you have a property that has 50 feet of frontage versus a property that has 250 feet of frontage, right now currently they both get the same size sign, which doesn't make a lot of uh, practical sense in terms of the sizes of development and how many tenants they can have in consideration of that. So something to think about there. Um, yeah, the, just on the slide, again, this is just a visual example. So you've got kind of a corner site here, a site with multiple street frontages. They would be allowed a freestanding sign at uh, every uh, side that has a street frontage. Um, and you can kind of see uh, those lot frontage area or lot frontage distances and what it translates when you use, utilize that 0.4 uh, multiplication factor. And the multiplication factors are kind of the, um, those are the levers that you can pull to either increase or decrease the amount of signage um, that you want uh, to kind of deploy in these different sign districts. Getting to building signs, so very much uh, similar um, structure. Uh, again, we're using tables to try and uh, deploy all this uh, information too so people can figure out, okay, I'm in this sign district, I want to do building signs, here's where I go. Uh, should be pretty straightforward. Another change is that the current uh, sign code has different signage allowances for all different types of building signs. Uh, wall signs are clearly the most popular kind of building sign, um, uh, but we want to move in a direction where each elevation is granted a certain amount of signage. However you deploy that between all the different sign types, that's kind of up to the property owner and the tenants in the building. Um, so notable changes. I, I highlighted, again, the class three is the one that we deal with the most, so I want to highlight that. What we're proposing is 1.25 square feet per linear foot of tenant space or building frontage. What this really makes easier too is just when you're dealing with a sign installer, you're typically not reworking the whole building. You're dealing with one discrete tenant space or one store frontage. And just having that frontage calculation makes it so much uh, easier for them. We are also proposing a cap uh, for no individual sign exceeding 250 feet. Um, so that's another thing to note is that kind of gets, I talked about the outlier situation where you have some very large signs just on the basis of very large um, uh, buildings with their very large facades. So some notable changes that I wanted to point out here and kind of seeking your feedback on. One change that we're proposing is uh, currently allowing uh, building signs on all four elevations of the what would be the new class three and that's today's class four, but it's where most of our commercial and industrial properties are. Currently, they're only allowed on any side that faces a public street, which makes sense, but also uh, either a primary or a secondary elevation. Uh, another tricky thing about that is they have different allowance sizes for the primary and the secondary. Again, we're trying to make this less complex. Um, but uh, we think that the, the nuisance characteristics associated with signage are driven by two main things, sign illumination and the brightness of the sign once it is lit. So if you have standards on when a sign can be lit in terms of proxi proximity to residential uses, um, uh, if it's too close, then it can't be lit. That kind of addresses one of the characteristics. If it can be lit, then, again, we already have a pretty effective uh, inspection program um, kind of run by planning staff where we do measure the brightness of signs. So we would continue to do that. And all that content is currently in the city's lighting ordinance. So um, we feel comfortable moving in a direction to allow more uh, signs on uh, more elevations of buildings, uh, which we already do in our mixed-use districts. So if you think about the B4s and the LXs and um, uh, HXR and kind of that, those more mixed-use type areas, um, they're already allowed that, um, uh, granted that. We haven't had a lot of issues with that. And of course, it's in a smaller area, but we just haven't had issues with it. Um, so that's another thing. And, you know, two... The, the other thing is just that um, buildings, just to give them more creativity, you can, you can think about a situation um, uh, where you have some internal uh, activity or event spaces within an internal courtyard of a building. If they've already maxed out their building frontage, they can't put any additional building branding or signage on that interior uh, facing area um, currently. So it just kind of stifles creativity uh, to a certain extent. Okay, special use sign standards. So one of our goals was to try and eliminate this as much as we can. Uh, and the reason being just that the more kind of carve outs, I, I don't want to call it that, but the more special standards you have for every individual use, it just keeps layering complexity uh, into the code um, that if you kind of take that to the, um, um, the extreme, just gets uh, really difficult to deal with. That being said, 
there does need to be some special considerations for certain uses uh, in Bloomington, not only to create a lot of nonconformity with what exists today, uh, but also just an acknowledgement that these standards existed for a reason. They were created in many ways. We were eliminate, were able to eliminate a lot of them, um, but there were some that we didn't feel that we could eliminate. So which ones are those? Freestanding signs, we do have special uh, standards proposed for college and school campuses. Um, we are uh, continuing some of the, the, sa the signage standards for high usage parks. You know, that's your Dred Scott, that's your Valley View, that's the, the most utilized parks in Bloomington. Uh, and of course the golf courses, we, that's new, we are proposing to add that. And then play fields, I know the school district is working on, um, uh, of course has Lincoln, but also is working on um, uh, properties, um, uh, or is working on the development of some additional play fields and it's becoming much more common to have some signage uh, associated with those. So that is built into the draft, I do, I do wanna highlight that. In terms of building signs, where do we think special use standards are necessary? Uh, so currently we have the office towers um, that have limited numbers of signs per elevation um, and have some special uh, size considerations given that they're, they're so far up that they do need to be larger. Um, uh, service area canopies, that's kind of a unique feature of that type of use uh, that is pretty common to deploy, deploy signage on at a gas station, of course. College campus signs, so light pole uh, signs, those types of things, and then signage on parking structures. So currently the existing sign code allows signs on parking structures only in certain sign districts. So we're proposing to not have it be only applicable to one or two sign districts, but just applicable uh, for parking structures that are above a certain number of stories, but limited to one sign per elevation uh, at a smaller size. So electronic signs, we get a lot of feedback about this one. Um, there's a lot of discussion, uh, both internal and external. But uh, I'll touch on a couple um, standards here. A new standard would be, uh, currently we don't have a cap on a maximum size for an electronic sign. And I should start by saying that the issue with electronic signs is just um, kind of more distracted driving, more distraction within the public realm can result in some uh, safety concerns just in terms of people utilizing the right of way, whether they be motorized or non-motorized um, uh, uh, transportation, including walking, of course. So we are proposing a uh, size cap that currently doesn't exist in the code. It is uh, somewhat common um, uh, among some of the ordinances that we studied to, to kind of recognize that these signs have a higher, uh, do, pr do present a higher instance of potential uh, public safety uh, concern. And so that's really what feeds into that. Um, setback from residential, that's retaining the same standard. I will talk about orientation here in a minute. Uh, but we currently have a 100-foot setback for these sign types from residential uses. Uh, dwell time, this is kind of the hot topic uh, for a lot of people from some of the feedback we get. Um, our existing standards is for changeable copy only uh, is 8 seconds, and for graphics is currently 20 minutes, and that just means that the sign can't change um, for that period of time. It has to stay static or remain the same. Um, our our draft sign code includes reducing the dwell time to graphics for 10 minutes, but I'll, you know, I want to be very uh, kind of straightforward about this issue is that the preferences range all over the map, and that's not just external, that's internal too. There are, you know, certainly elements of uh, the city that, you know, wish they could do more programming, particularly parks and rec and fire public safety messages on these sign types. Um, and then kind of on the other side of that coin is certainly traffic and other staff who are, have more concern about the visual clutter, but also the distraction and those kind of elements. Um, what to my own, and so the external piece of it, yes, there's certainly a lot of external parties that want to reduce our dwell time for these sign types. Um, the frustrating piece or the challenging piece maybe for uh, the staff working on the ordinance is that there is a ton of research out there about this very topic, but it has not been able to establish a broad consensus as to uh, what the exact, what the best standard should be um, uh, for certain even driving speeds like road types, because that's, driv that's driven by some of it, um, but also just uh, kind of uh, various environments in terms of land use type and those things. What you often see is eight seconds a lot, and the reason you see eight seconds is because the Federal Highway Administration issued a report some years ago where they landed on, can absolutely be no smaller than eight seconds, or shorter than I should say, not smaller, um, so that's why you see that kind of a lot. But what I would tell you is that even within our own region here, you'll see uh, the range is, I know of a city that has a three-second dwell time, and that's for, that's for anything, not video, but just um, obviously. But 
Uh, they have a three second dwell time, and then there's a community um, near us that has a 60 minute <laughs> dwell time. So that's the range that we're dealing with on this stuff. Uh, so it's it's kind of challenging. So I mean, I certainly would welcome your feedback, uh, particularly on that. When we pulled this question, there was a mix of wanting to keep our existing standards in place or uh, reduce them. So kind of just uh, taking temperature on that uh, here yet again. And and I, I think it's a tricky issue. And depending on what ang what uh, what area you're coming at it from, it. Um, uh, I respect all the opinions on both sides of it in terms of um, what their goals are. On the nighttime restriction piece, so this would be something that's new. Um, currently, we have an orientation standard that these electronic signs can't be visible from a residential property within 150 feet. It acts as another de facto setback, in effect. What we would propose to go away from that, and again, as being more considerate of the nuisance characteristics, is that if it's within 150 feet, the sign either be turned off uh, you know, during the nighttime hours, however you define that, or it remains static. Because one of the issues with the electronic signs, what makes it a higher nuisance, is that this, the message is changing frequently, which casts light in different ways um, uh, to nearby properties. So either static or um, uh, turned off, you know, that does have the potential for some additional enforcement component, but we already deal with that in some levels on sign brightness and those types of things. So a couple things to consider or think about there. Um, that's the extent of the uh, main things I wanted to present to you in terms of the content. There are other sections of the um, draft sign code that I didn't touch on this, just in respect to time. Um, we certainly can talk about those things, but in terms of next steps, what we're thinking about, as I mentioned, we did this same exercise with Planning Commission. It was a good discussion. Um, uh, they felt uh, ready or comfortable with the state of the draft to go forward into a public hearing process, uh, recognizing, A, that there can be a lot more engagement and feedback done through that process, but also with the city being the applicant, we're not subject to any uh, agency action timeline uh, requirement and along those ends. So we really have the opportunity to start the public engagement process, but um, uh, continue to refine if need be, uh, depending on uh, what adjustments need to be made. So uh, if we get kind of that uh, uh, kind of that green light or that thumbs up, we would begin drafting the full version of the ordinance, dealing with all those cross references and connective tissue, like I talked about. We'll continue to engage with uh, people. We've, we've had a number of meetings with. Uh, different parties who are interested in this topic, and I would expect they, you know, will be uh, submitting comments and reaching out to you all as the decision makers about this process. So um, I think that uh, I'm optimistic that we're going to get good engagement on this process. And then uh, again, finally, just um, going forward in scheduling public hearings if we think we're ready. If we were to move along that staff and planning commission recommended uh, timeline, um, we would be doing these refinements and revisions in December of this year and then schedule a public hearing at Planning Commission in January and uh, an anticipated hearing at City Council in February. So that's where we're at from a, a timeline perspective. Happy to take your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, so I was going to try and help you out and go back to all the slides and look at where you had the bolded areas and then realize that the presentation doesn't have any of those bolded areas in them. Oh, so, the pe yeah. Oops. So I missed, I missed on that. I apologize. So because I wanted to go through step by step. I think you said you did something similar with the Planning Commission, and I want to make sure that we answer the questions or at least have the discussions where you'd like to have the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I can uh, identify those points. That would be helpful. But, yeah. but I, And I also welcome just general questions, too, because I know it's an extensive document, but sure. I can lead you through those. Why don't we start with any general questions and then we can double back to uh, some of the more specific discussion areas that uh, Mr. Johnson wants to talk with. Uh, Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so first general question, uh, I know that there have been a couple of businesses who have struggled with um, the sign ordinance relatively recently, mm -hmm. meaning like the last four years um, since I've been on. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if, um, if you engaged with them in um, making these decisions or getting to a point of recommendation, I should say, and, and or are you planning to bring this to some of those businesses so that they could um, weigh in on whether this may, would have been more helpful in their experience with the city? Yeah, Mayor Council Member uh, Carter, uh, we generally have let, um, if I mean, it depends on which individual businesses you're talking about, of course, but um, the, the people that I'm aware of that I know have expressed some uh, or have had some challenges uh, we have been promoting this process uh, to them or their representatives. 
Um, so I, you know, I feel confident that we've been doing a good job in that regard. Um, that being said, I mean, I, I still, I, I think we're only, you know, maybe I've only talked with 20% of the people who will ultimately engage the process because sometimes it all just comes in one big wave and that's okay if it does. Um, but I'd be, uh, and, I mean, if anyone, if the word is a way to get a word out, I'm happy to engage with anyone about their specific concerns. Okay. Um, yep. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, well, and I can just email you two of the businesses I'm thinking of specifically. Mm -hmm. So, um, another general question. I'm just curious when you made the decisions of, um, uh, the, the different classes, classes, that's what we're calling them. Yes. Um, I'm just curious why B1 and I1 were included in the new class two and not class three with other, the other B and C, most of the other B and C zones. Yeah, Mayor, Councilmember McCarter, that's a good question. So um, B1 and I1 are currently in our existing class three and they function as very small um, uh, footprint or uh, low impact kind of commercial and industrial development. Um, not only that, but there's very few of these properties in I was Bloomington. trying to find them on our map, and I, like, couldn't even find them. So Yeah, yeah. Okay. so they're, you know, not B1. Well, maybe not either, but um, it'd be good to try and, get, you know, consolidate some of those things. But um, to answer your question directly, these properties actually have, uh, you know, they're closer to residential uses in many cases, as few of them as there are. Uh, and they happen to be much smaller developments. So having a flat, lower uh, freestanding and building signage allowance is actually more in line with our multifamily residential districts than it is uh, um, uh, with the allowances within the class, the new class three, or what all the other commercial and okay, industrial that properties makes sense. have. That makes sense. I'll just ask two more questions. I'm going back to the electronic and video signs and talking about dwell time. I still don't really understand the difference between a changeable copy sign and a graphic display sign. So is changeable copy just words? Mayor Councilmember Carter, that's correct. So okay. just text on a, um, a uniform background of some color. Okay, and then, and then so, so this, this specific, like this picture right here, this would be a, a graphic. Correct. Okay, yep. all right, thank you. Um, and then my last question, I mean, I can weigh in on the specifics that you want, but kind of more general. Um, in the... Initial feedback from external companies, and this was like going way back into the documents, um, they, there was an indication that in other cities it was laid out in table format, and so it was easier to understand like what the requirements were. Mm -hmm. And so I noticed we have tables in our newly developed ordinance <coughs> language, mm -hmm. and is that what they were referring to? Or is there some way we could even have like the official language, but then have a tool that makes it even more straightforward and simple? Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Carter, and um, generally uh, we can utilize we try and utilize tables as much as we can. To typically, when there's uh, a lot of inputs, like the number of sign districts and a lot of uh, rows, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, sorry, the standards on top rows or the sign districts uh, in the rows. But um, take, for example, electronic signs. You could easily move this information into a table. It would be a smaller, discrete table. But yes, we try and utilize that formatting because it's much easier for uh, installers. It's mostly signed contractors and installers who review our code, sometimes businesses, um, usually only when something goes wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so they, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about it's much easier to locate this uh, information. Our current sign code, um, in deference to you know the staff and the group that put that together in the 90s, it's just a very long, redundant list uh, under each sign district, and it becomes very difficult to find what you're looking for in that format. <clears throat> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I did. <clears throat> I do recall the uniformity of construction style was one of your questions, and I am f in favor with what the staff is proposing. And then I also am supportive of the um, change to electronic signs in uh, near residential areas. And I'm not remembering the nighttime that. restriction. Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. And then I will just plant the seed now. I would love to talk a little bit more about billboards, but I will not say anything about that yet. If there are others who are also interested in having a little bit more discussion about our standards there. All right. Again, general questions, and then we'll double back to the specifics here. Uh, Councilmember Lohman. So maybe we're going to go through the slides, each one of them, or 
Yeah, I think there was maybe a half dozen, I think, with something okay. bolded on that the uh, staff was looking for specific discussion on. Okay, I'll hold those off then. So then my, just the one, okay. so then I had the one question uh, uh, with respect to uh, municipal entities uh, along with nonprofit services. Um, you know, I know we don't have specific zoning um, mm -hmm you know, components or codes for those particular areas. And so what I'm just curious about, you know, with that, with that respect, um, do other cities have an advantage because they have those separate districts, uh, districts when it relates to how they enforce, you know, for those particular entities uh, that are like that? And that's kind of where my question lies, you know, because I, I see that with the, with the, uh, um, the special use sign standards uh, with respect to um, schools, but then my question then relies w with respect to you know yeah, fire stations and like that kind of thing. So uh, that was kind of where my question lies. You know, you know, do, do, you know, do, do those those uh, cities have an advantage when they have those those separate? Uh, you could separate that out. Yeah, Mayor Councilor Loman, I don't know if I would say they have an advantage, but there's two primary wise uh, ways uh, from the sign ordinances I've reviewed. Um, to kind of organize uh, regulatory allowances around signage. There's uh, either by their zoning district or a sign district, by consolidating zoning districts into sign districts, or it's by uses specifically. And so you'll see some sign codes that have industrial use signage standards or retail or, you know, so on and so forth. And so they certainly could have uh, a government one. Um, you're correct in that we have addressed some of that issue by having special standards for larger parks, which are zoned R1, which is all most of our uh, public properties or government properties are zoned uh, R1. Um, but the other way that we do that is by having allowances for non-residential uses in the Class 1, which is also utilized by places of assembly, um, which are zoned R1. And so that's really the main way that you get around it. Now, you can kind of uh, create either more signage or less signage for non-residential uses in the R1. That's up to us wherever we set the, the parameter, so to speak. Um, uh, but, I, I mean, anecdotally from going through the process previously with the fire stations, for example, uh, the amount of signage, the quantity of signage, uh, they found adequate uh, to meet their needs. So you certainly can visit those sites and see if that's kind of an appropriate or uh, amount of signage. They utilize a flat amount of signage. Um, uh, there are some caps on the number uh, and then um, uh, just in terms of the amount per wall area. But what I would say is that they effectively uh, utilized a similar allowance because the allowance isn't proposed to change that much from the existing to the code. The formatting and how the, the information is delivered is much different, but um, the overall allowance in the, the class one uh, remains relatively the same. Yeah, I guess that's sort of, I mean, not so much for that a aspect of it. That certainly gets me to part of it, but it's just those, a lot of those nonprofits in terms of what they're trying to do or uh, when county comes in or other you know, governmental entities come in and they want to you know, try to provide a different type of service. Those are kind of the concerns I kind of have you know, with that. And since we're already looking at it, that's sort of where my question is, if we ought to you know, dive a little deeper into that, uh, those pieces. So um, in particular with the, with the nonprofit organizations, we talk about creativity and that type of thing. Um, you know, as we kind of move in our direction as a city, um, I, I want to be able to make sure when we look at uh, larger cities uh, and what they do, you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul, how do we allow that creativity to exist since we have that, that residential standard with the class? Yeah, thank you. It's well taken. And you could, you know, you could tweak uh, special use standards for that. Again, there's want to try and uh, limit the use of special use sign districts, but obviously there's certain properties in the R1 that are much have much different needs than than most. Can I see another hand? Go ahead, Councilmember Nelson, please. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. And I will keep this general. Although I do have a number of specific things that I don't. Frankly, I think it makes a lot of sense to take the council's time going through. Um, so my question is, you're still looking for input from other groups and, and things to the specifics? Okay. If that's the case, then, because I see some things with regards to the real estate industry, um, the home remodeling industry specifics in here that I think would be good. I'll help connect you and, and share some Thank of those you. thoughts and concerns. That's great. Thank you. And be very helpful. Thank you, council member. If we're through with the general questions, why don't you just, if you could, run through the 
Yeah, yeah and I appreciate useful. and I appreciate your comment in that regard too. I kind of struggle with this type of a thirty-five page document mm. of uh, you know of how to how to best utilize your time and you know um, and those things. But yeah, so like one of the um, these are just the things that to, to mo- I'll be frank to Glenn and I. These things are the things that we hear the most or where we think that uh, we just wanted the most direction on. So this uniformity of construction issue, I know that um, some cities uh, establish that requirement. Staff has presented to you for five or so reasons why we don't think that's the best uh, role of the sign code uh, to enforce that thing. But that being said, one of the purposes is managing visual clutter. It's where you want to draw that line in terms of uh, how valuable or important you think that is to the aesthetics of the community um, as you look at it. So we would be seeking uh, guidance on that. But I'm, I'll be blunt, it does add uh, layers of complexity that are sometimes frustrating and uh, not just for staff, for the public as well. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you. Um, is that oftentimes also just clarified by the building owner so that they would have their own standards like for uniformity as well, so it may not be an issue that the city needs to be involved in. Yeah, Mayor Councilor Nelson, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation, so we currently have this process called the Uniform Sign Design, and it's a requirement for all multi-tenant properties and and developments that have multiple buildings, as well as for hotels and a few other reasons that it's unnecessary for. Um, But this new sign code has a similar process called a comprehensive sign plan, wherein a property owner can apply to establish uh, this type of um, uh, system on their property where they do have to have uniform construction. So I should say that this sign code doesn't ignore it completely. There is a pathway for property owners that want an approval to be established on their lot so that no one can uh, apply for a sign permit of the sign type that doesn't meet their need. Um, there is a pathway to do that. It's just now optional, discretionary. Um, but yes, a lot of times, I know I don't want to single out Krauss Anderson, but to, I, their one user just comes to my mind that it's very important to them that their signage be met at Southtown, for example, or some of the other multi-tenants. So it's very much some, it's something that uh, some property owners are just want to get the tenant in and establish the business. They're not too particular about what the sign looks like. And others, it is very important to them to remain uh, uniformity. And that's where we think that discussion is best held. Very good. So with that, I'll maybe should I go on to the next one? Let's do that. Sounds good. Um, again, I'm just going to focus on the bold ones. Was there any concerns about having signs on all four building elevations of commercial and industrial properties so long as we manage the lighting and uh, brightness nuisance issues? Is that okay? Seeing head nodding on that one. Member Loman, question? I'm going to hold my questions on that one till later on. Well, I, I think we're on this one now. So if you've got a question... Um, because I think, uh, if you don't mind, I would I'd like to come back to this one um, after I have the other uh, other piece because I think that might answer my question. Okay. If you don't mind, I mean, sure. if not, I want to go to that slide and then <laughs> have us jumping around. So I can make that work, I guess. So dwell time, uh, electronic signs. Again, this is one that we get a wide range of feedback about, and um, uh, just again judging from the range that I've seen in the region. Um, three seconds all the way up to 60 minutes. Um, this is really something that the, the governing bodies and the planning commission and council can really um, uh, kind of settle in on and establish what they think is appropriate for uh, their community. Council, so, thoughts on this? Council Member Lohman? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so if we could start off with uh, the residential setback piece, um, because... When I'm, I'm curious about with the uh, the lighting standard, what is that, you know, just generally uh, that we have within that standard? Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, if you're going down, you know, Penn Avenue, because I know we had that, that issue with the, uh, uh, with the storage you know, units where you had the bright sign going on. Mm-hmm. How does that fit with this, this piece? Help me understand that. Yeah, Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, um, uh, so every sign in Bloomington is subject to a maximum brightness level. It's called NITS, uh, candelas per square meter. And the, the intensity of the light that you can cast out of that in NITS uh, is different depending on uh, whether you are within a certain distance of residential properties. And so that's what establishes it. When we get a sign permit and it's near residential uses, it's a, it's a uh, blatant condition right on the permit that goes out. You can only be this bright, your sign, and it will be inspected, and we do. Um, and so we do issue orders when they don't uh, conform to those types of things. 
Um, I don't have the specific number off the top of my head, but that's how the basic program works. If you're, uh, and we, we are still kind of a dark, we're not, we haven't adopted the formal dark skies ordinance. So I don't want to say that, but we have many dark skies elements to our lighting code. Um, and one of, one of those is, which is establishing maximum brightness, um, on different sources of light, including signs. And so when a use is close, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a standard sign or an electronic sign, there's maximum brightness levels that that sign can be. And what it really does effectively is in the evening time, it dulls it down uh, to a level that uh, creates less of a nuisance for the abutting or adjacent properties. Okay. Because I think that's where my main, um, you know, Mayor, when I, I think about this is where my main concern is, it's around nuisance you know, within residential properties, you know, so if you've got that, you know, you know, 100 foot standard or whatever that is, but from the lighting perspective, or if it's a video, you know, if it's playing all the time, um, which is kind of my next, my next question is around the around the video piece, where does that does that fit into either of these changeable copy or graphics Does the video fit into that? Or is this we're not necessarily to that standard where we'll allow you to have a whole video playing. Yeah, Mayor Councilmember Lohman, so video signs and billboards, get into your question about billboards. So those are, um, uh, the restrictions on them today are effectively um, kind of eliminates new opportunities to do it. Not for not so much for video signs, but in so much as this, video signs are not allowed uh, where they're visible to adjoining properties or the public right-of-way. So that eliminates a lot of the locational opportunities to have video signs. Um, in Bloomington. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I know. I think that answers it pretty clearly. So then I guess my next my next piece that I'll go to, and then I'll just state my, uh, I think I'm done with my questions here. So I guess when I'm looking at this policy perspective, is the nuisance component of it. I'm, I'm concerned. I want to, I'd rather be more um, uh, careful or more restrictive at the beginning of it and then loosen that standard up a little bit more. Uh, um, you know, go, okay, well, is this, is this okay? Does this work? Because I think it's a lot harder to kind of ramp that back, um, you know, it, or, you know, you have, you have residents that say, hey, you know, I'm okay with that, you know, having this <laughs> this bright thing here, you know, I support that, you know, I, that's a little easier. And the other thing around the, you know, this, this graphic piece is that I know that the uh, uh, the national, at a National League of Cities thing, they had the Federal Highway Administration talk about, you know, the zero death uh, kind of piece. And I know you've kind of talked a little bit about the survey out there of the, of the literature out there, but I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. And I know that uh, planners that I worked with before when I was was here were very concerned about that, you know, when you, when you have these graphic, you know, uh, signs or video signs that are, are taking place, you know, how that could lead to that. And that's the, the main concern I have with that, you know, either death or some type of, uh, casualty as you're you know, driving down the road or injury or that type of thing. So again, I'd like to try to see if we can, you know, be cautious as we kind of move down that, that, that process uh, of that and then open up the standards. Or if there's some type of evidence that's out there that shows that, you know, that, you know, less than eight seconds is not a big deal or less than 10 minutes, you know, that we're not going to create that. That's my, my greatest concern that I have around that. And then once you kind of do that, you know, trying to pull that back, um, and, and we're also a very large city, so we're, you know, I think folks are going to be looking to see what we do around the signage stuff and try to adopt, you know, similar, uh, similar stuff. So I want to be careful with that. So as I look at that, that's what I'm looking at. And I hope that answers your questions you have here. I think so. And, and Mayor Councilmember Lowen, if I can add two, two elements, and I should have explained this better when thinking about kind of the science of dwell time, what you're really, I mean, you can go very strict, and some cities have, as I mentioned, but um, what you're really trying to minimize is the amount that the sign is changing while uh, the number of times the sign is changing when one, if you're talking about motor vehicles, when one traveler is passing that sign. And that obviously depends on roadway speed, like I said. Um, but what that gets you to is if you only want that sign to be able to change once for the majority or even a good proportion of drivers, you want to dwell time that's a minute or more, not you know, um, a, a few seconds, because then there's the potential to, to see multiple changes as a passing uh, motorist uh, or traveler. So that there's that piece of it. Um, darn it, I forgot the second piece of it. Forgive me. Oops. I'll return to it if I uh, think of it. Sorry about that. Uh, the other thing I'd say, though, is that a lot of cities don't have different standards between changeable copy and graphics. Um, and the reason that Bloomington does and some cities do is that graphics are more distracting or more uh, have more safety uh, issues. There's just there is some science behind that. 
So you're saying if we were to take this graphics down to one minute, that might only, depending on the speed, really amount to being at one. You know, you're only going to have one change while you're while you're driving through the through the area. Is that what I'm hearing you say? And then we would increase the changeable copy up to it, one minute. Is that? I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're. Uh, forgive me, I didn't. Yeah, and Councilor Loman, I didn't mean to confuse. I think the eight. We were one thing we were concerned about with. Uh, fidgeting with the eight seconds is that there's a lot of properties that have these signs that are already kind of operating under that. So it's kind of hard to put the dragon back in the box. Which demonstrates my point exactly. So yes, um, <laughs> forgive me, but um, so I think we I, th I think we still think it is sensical to maintain two different standards because they pose different uh, levels of uh, concern or threat, whatever term you want to use uh, in that regard. So we think that's good. It's not to say that if you lower it just to a minute that um, it really depends on the travel speed in terms of how many transitions of the sign you'll see. If you're on a low speed uh, roadway and it's a 30 second dwell time and you're on a very long quarter, you can imagine a quarter like Lindale, it's possible you could see two transitions uh, in that period of time. And so it just kind of depends on what your tolerance is. The second thing, I remember what I was going to say, so I'm going to go back to that. But the nighttime, you, you said you were concerned about the nuisance characteristics. If there's greater concern about the nuisance characteristics, and I have seen other cities do this, you could require the signs to be extinguished uh, during the nighttime when they're in proximity to residential uses. What we're proposing is either static or extinguished, and the reason that we're proposing that is just that they do, it does have different uh, levels of enforcement uh, issues associated with them. If you're going to establish a standard that all electronic signs close to residential uses, and if you think about it, it's a lot of places of assembly uh, typically have these signs. Um, the city's going to be doing some enforcement on some of those things if it has to be turned off. Um, they might have to still be doing some if it just to remain static too. Um, but in other words, that's another one of the levers you can pull to be more cautious, as you said, uh, than less. The other thing I didn't say about electronic signs is, or one dynamic, is that this technology is becoming more affordable as time goes on. And so we, we, we within the planning division, very much can envision an environment 40 or 50 or maybe even sooner years from now where the majority of signs are electronic signs, not, not less or a small percentage of them because of the cost. So it, with a lower dwell time, you can imagine every building now has one of these sign types, and their freestanding signs are that sign type. And if they're all allowed to have very low dwell times, you're basically in a situation where you're not able to manage the visual clutter and all of just the bombardment of commercial messages that are along your streetscape. So that's where it really uh, becomes a concern. And that might be a city council's problem, the, you know, the 2060 city council's problem, not the 2023's problem. But... Um, but I also think about the dragon back in the box dynamic that I also just said. So it's it's tricky. I don't know what they're, it's tough. I, I appreciate that, and honestly, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. Although, if you play out that scenario, boy, we could go in a bunch of different directions in terms of that as well. Uh, no cars. Or no, I was thinking more <laughs> on the lines of advertisements on your windshield, on the inside of your windshield, oh. projected. You know, I, any number of different things. Uh, Regarding the dwell time, I would say that three seconds is probably way too short and an hour is way too long. And <laughs> to look so, thank you. And I, so that, that's why I appreciate just, just trying to come up with this, this. This eight seconds and 10 minutes makes sense. I mean, to make a, an electronic sign worth anything, you've, the, the copy's got to be able to change. I, I th and frankly, I think we see that also within the city. I mean, you look at Normandale and 84th and, and right out front here and everything else, it, we, we see that if, if, it's, if it's hanging on the same message for, far, for too long, it does, there's no benefit to it. There really is no benefit to it. So um, I, I appreciate the, the eight seconds, the 10 minutes. It probably makes sense. I can't say it's the absolute best thing. I can't say it's the absolute worst thing, but I think it, it makes sense for the information that we have. And especially if you've been going through the, the research and the, the data on it and can't find anything that says this is the magic number, I think this, this makes as much sense as anything else. To Councilmember Lohman's point regarding the nighttime restrictions, I think absolutely static between 9 and 7 a.m. Uh, if you're anywhere near a residential, um, I, I think that just makes a lot of sense. And, and I don't know if turned off, because you're right, then when the enforcement issues come up, but absolutely static. I would hate to see things changing and flashing and uh, 
being that much of a distraction in a in in the nighttime hours. Anything else on that, Council? Mayor, the last thing I'll say about it is that I think we've already gotten some feedback um, uh, concerned about 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'm just, um, that that's going to come your way. Good to know. With, Good to know. Uh, coming down the pike here. But yes, it's a tricky thing for sure. Thank you for the feedback, though. Um, I think that was it on the specific, uh, okay. on the specific topics. Um, again, this is one of those ordinances where we almost don't know where to, do the specifics, and Councilmember Nelson mentioned the difficulty of going line by line through a you know a 35-page document. So, yeah. um, but I think what we're really interested in is the bigger picture: is our do we feel we're in a place to move towards a public hearing type setting? I, I'm I'm feeling confident, Councilmember Loman. You want did you want to make your your point or ask your question? No, I got a couple other ones, uh, um, and I, and I can be just real real quick. We did talk about the special um, use sign standard piece, and I, I'd love to come in and talk with you a little bit more about sure. that. I don't want to waste our time up here, uh, you know, get into the levels of details. Yeah. I remember I was here when we were doing the, the sign thing, and I kind of love this stuff. Um, so then my other my other one is around the area sign piece. Um, so when you know we had the, the the footage limits for the different classes, I I'm curious a little bit about you know about that those limits on the square footage of the signage. Um, you, you had it back there the other way. Go back one more, I think. Yeah, this one here I think is the free, yeah with the freestanding signs. Um, so the maximum limits that are on on those particular signs. What was the rationale? To, to get you to those maximum limits. And then, you know, because I think about, you know, we, we have with the PMP, you know, the, you know, we do that, that whole, you know, front footage type of thing and then kind of, you know, base the, you know, taxes on that. I, I'm, just, I'm just curious, but I'll stop there and let you kind of answer because then I may have more questions. Yeah, Mayor, Mem uh, Mayor Councilmember Loman, good questions. And um, I think it's, so one thing I didn't mention tonight that I'm going to mention at whenever this does come before a public hearing process that I think the city is going to be in a better position uh, with these regulations uh, to do a one-year look back following its adoption because ultimately we're going to get a lot of data in that first year of like where the ordinance is performing well and where the standards maybe are a little bit out of step or should be evaluated uh, depending on kind of what we learn or what we glean in that first year. So that's one piece of it. Um, how did we arrive at that? Um, uh, currently we have flat allowances now. So the hundred, uh, square feet actually matches a lot of the allowances for, um, uh, single tenant and all the majority of our commercial and industrial standards. Now there is some larger allowances for larger multi-tenant sites in the existing sign code. And so the, the, the cap at 100, that's really something that you can, it's informed by, uh, what it, what exists today in the sign code. It's also informed by, uh, we looked at over 50 wall signs and 25 freestanding signs that we've reviewed in the past, I don't know, five or seven years or whatever it was. And the majority of them are accommodated within, uh, this cap. Um, and the majority of them were accommodated within that 0.4 of having a frontage that the existing sign that was there, uh, met it. But just from our perspective, again, getting back to the purpose of one of the purposes of signage regulations is to manage the visual clutter of speech as you uh, travel in, in the public realm. Um, having a standard that is tied to the, the size of the property, which the best measure is the lot frontage along a public street, uh, just to us made the most sense in terms of how to uh, distribute uh, the amount of signage. Uh, we have some small commercial sites or even almost flag sites that even if you had just a very small amount of frontage, you would be granted the same signage allowance as a very large, uh, you know, in some cases, multi-tenant property. And we just don't think that's in, in the same vein or in line with managing visual clutter. So, um, so that's kind of what, that's what informed it. So it is possible that if you have a larger site that you could gain additional footage from that, from that maximum is what, what you're saying. Uh, as it's currently drafted, it would depend on where you're located. So there are provisions for uh, some sites and special zoning districts, but all the sites along uh, 494. So the cap goes up, basically, and the sign height goes up okay. if you're along those roadways because that was one of the downstream effects of consolidating 
some of the sign districts is that we currently have the class five sign district, which is South town and these larger freeway oriented development sites. They have very large allowances uh, for signage, both from an area and height perspective. And if you're going to consolidate those things, you have to create locational criteria as opposed to uh, create at wanting to have them be separate sign districts. So I guess where I'm, I'm challenged with it, and I'm not suggesting we change it because, again, you know, based on the principle I just said before, once you know, if you have that much larger and now you're trying to shrink it, you're, that's not going to happen. But the thing that you know you, you mentioned that you know I, I tend to agree with is that this idea of creativity by having this maximum on some of these, you know, these rather large sites, you know, that, that can restrict that creativity. So it, it almost contradicts what we're saying in terms of, of that. So that's what, you know, not, not saying for this draft, but maybe as we're, 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 as we're going out further, we want to look at that and see, you know, if that makes sense. I like the look back idea because that kind of covers that, but mm -hmm. um, that seemed to be kind of, you know, just a nuanced contradiction. <laughs> you know, we want creativity, but we're going to maximize this, you know, and you, and you have to have that from the restriction. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. But that seemed to, um, and I suppose you could cover it by a variance, but, you know. Um, Ultimately, our goal is that the, le the like, I'm going to keep using this word, the, the levers or the lever of what you tweak, say it's not providing enough signage. If that's the case, then it can be a very simple or discrete um, code uh, change just to that one number or that one multiplication factor later. Um, if we can get the right structure and the right format and the right organization of this ordinance, then the the little levers uh, can be easily tweaked quite easily uh, down the road. Um, but yes, you do have to land somewhere. My computer's dying. <laughs> I, I think that's a, a sign. That's absolutely a sign. <laughs> End of my questions, then. <laughs> I think uh, the final question that I have, uh, looking at the anticipated timeline and looking at the, the work that you've already put into it, into all of this, uh, is that anticipated timeline one that you're comfortable with? And you, trust me, we're going to get you out of here in just okay. a matter of moments anyway. That's good. Thank you. Uh, uh, you're comfortable with the anticipated timeline in terms of getting out to the Planning Commission public hearing and the City Council public hearing and so on? Yeah, Kevin and I actually uh, spoke just before the meeting, and uh, we kind of talked about what our uh, – we kind of strategized and game planned out um, the next uh, month or so of activity that sets that up properly, and uh, we're pretty confident we can meet that. It's going to be pulling together, as I said, all the different cross-references within our code, and there are there are many of them. Mm -hmm. So whereas I touted the 35-page sign code document, the ordinance itself is probably going to be significantly longer than that, um, unfortunately. We will need to – you should do summary publication on it's that four. one. Exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I think we feel good about this timeline and uh, are excited to Very good. Uh, move this project along. Council, additional questions? Council Member Carter? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I just have a quick question around the billboard. So in the staff report, um, I do agree. I mean, I don't think we should allow more billboards. Um, but the current billboards, my understanding is then that they, they are um, subject to the same requirements and standards. So um, if one of the owners of one of the billboards wanted to change it to be an electro electronic sign, they could within the requirement, like they, they would just have to follow our policy here. Yeah, Mayor Councilor Carter, they definitely would have to follow the dwell time and whatever you establish for that. That is not subject to a, that's an operational feature. It's not a subject to a nonconformity, um, like building a structure that doesn't yeah. no longer meets a setback type of thing. So it would uh, meet that. Um, Kevin's going to want to talk about this one because it's one of his uh, sweet spots. So, but it, there's a little bit of uh, difficulty in understanding because in order to make a sign electronic, inevitably it gets bigger because the components of it. So you're expanding the physical size of the sign, yeah. and there's some uh, discussion about whether or not that is expanding a nonconformity. So, um, just as a like to put this like to give some context, one one reason I'm curious is because I'm a former Veep board member. Mm -hmm. I think you are now, so maybe you shouldn't be part of this conversation. But I believe that Veep actually owns one of the or or earns some revenue from one of the billboards in Bloomington. So one of our local nonprofits, right? Mm -hmm. And if they were able to make it electronic and have more um, marketing or whatever yep. on that sign, that would increase their revenue. So anyway, I just I was thinking of it from that perspective, and so. Um, so wanted to just better understand, yeah, 
because it would be making it slightly bigger, mm-hmm. like would would the owners of these yeah. billboards be able to do that or not? It depends. Um, so I'm Kevin Toski, Assistant City Attorney, a mayor and members. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, yeah, so our current billboards are legally non-conforming. So the Supreme Court has kind of told us that you really have to key in on physical expansion of non-conformity, not say things like intensity or um, brightness, things like that. So if they can swap out and get an electric billboard without you know, expanding the size of the sign, the cabinet, the depth, they could do it. Um, they'd be subject to, to uniform standards with dwell time like Nick talked about. But I'm thinking it would be pretty tough to do that um, just based on changing out a cabinet. So Got it. The, so sta- if, the so standard in say, state law is substantially yeah. equivalent. So whenever you're making those sizes larger, typically you're encroaching further into nonconforming setbacks or creating other problems mm-hmm. too. It's not just the uh, nature yeah. of the – there's others kind of downstream things that happen. So if um, if some of the owners of these signs came to us and said, hey, we want to be able to do this, would we have to, because they're legally nonconforming, would we just have to change, like, would we have to look at our policy stance as it relates to billboards to allow that to happen, or could we make some changes as we are now? Uh, Mayor and still be legally nonconforming, but they would just be allowed to do that. Yeah, Mayor, um, Councilmember Carter, we'd have to look at, we'd have to change code probably to get there, but it's probably something we could look at um, okay. doing, but it would require a code change the way it's written right now. So. Okay. I mean, I personally would be interested in that, but I, again, I'm not mm-hmm. interested in like opening up areas for more billboards, but for yeah. the ones that are in place, I think you said there's four. I mean, it seems like if four they wanted to bring their billboards up to the, you know, current century, like... Like they they should maybe be able to do that, but um, yeah. so I'll just put that out there. Thank you. And uh, mayor and members, our our current code, you know, billboards are non-conforming. But if you if you do swap to and can get there to swap to electronic, there's all these several standards that apply that you know help with nuisances. So the dwell time, the I know there's several other you know requirements that apply to just electronic billboards too. So nuisances would be managed. So thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Forgive my uh, poor computer uh, charging skills. (laughs) Sorry about that. (laughs) Thank you all very much. Council, our last item tonight is item 5.3, our city council policy and issue update. Uh, I'll just do a start with a quick recap of our listening session. We had one member of the public come into our listening session, Kevin Heinen. Uh, Kevin was parking in the back of his home and parking on what he said was an appropriate surface, and he got a compliance notice from the city saying it wasn't an appropriate surface. We did ask Mr. Verbrugge to direct uh, environmental health to to directify things, to figure out exactly what the situation was and to, to act accordingly. Mr. Heinen also had other additional questions about uh, a hole in his backyard from a removed utility pole and cut cable lines and a couple of other things. Again, asked Mr. Uh, Verbrugge to look into that, and, and uh, we'll get a report back, hopefully, uh, that things worked out to uh, everyone's satisfaction. The the second thing that I want to bring up uh, today, I, back on November 22nd, Bloomington lost a, uh, a, a, a titan of the city. Uh, Gil, Gil Williams was just huge, and he passed away at age 87. Uh, a heck of a guy, did so much for this community over so long, and uh, we're, we're very sad to see him go. Did not realize that... Uh, he was uh, actually uh, the chair of the Bloomington HRA and the, and the Bloomington School Board and served with the JCs and the Bloomington Youth Commission. Um, but his biggie, of course, was the Bloomington Community Foundation. He was president there since 1996, also worked quite a bit with uh, Normandale Community College, with artistry. He, was, he had a huge impact on this community, and he's going to be missed. And I just wanted to bring that up and um, send our condolences to his family and uh, send a thanks to Gil for all he did for this community over a long, long time. He did a great work. Great work. Mr. Verbrugge, anything to add tonight? No, sir. Council, anything to bring forward? 
Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm glad you were able to mention that. It came up at the Rotary meeting as well uh, today. He's also a member of the Rotary as well. <laughs> so I uh, want to be sure we mention that as well. The only other thing I wanted to mention is um, I very much do enjoy our, our equity, our race and equity and inclusion uh, review of all of our policies. Um, you know, I, one of the things that we have done, um, I think it was last year, um, is that we passed a climate emergency. And one of the things I think would be helpful for us to do just as a, as a deliberative body is to start looking at um, maybe adding in that sustainability policy review when we get to the end of uh, a lot of our, our, our things that we look at. Maybe not everything, um, you know, because one question I had that I didn't want to ask, you know, with a sign piece is, you know, you know, is there anything around that? Is there any literature around that idea with the sign thing or if you – you know, have the signs located in a certain way or certain materials, uh, if you could put that in there. Is there a sustainable uh, benefit to reduction of uh, greenhouse uh, uh, impact? So um, if that's something that, you know, that other council members would be interested in, I know that I as a council member would be interested in that. As And I don't, I know, again, you have to, you know, crawl, <laughs> walk, and run with any policy type of thing. And I think we've we've gotten pretty far along with the uh, the race and, and equity review piece. But I really would like us to start looking at the uh, sustainability. And it might make some sense as we're looking at the sustainability piece, since we have been linking that with the health component of it, to, to kind of try to do both things at the same time. So, Good point. Good point. Council Member Carter. Um, so I am definitely supportive of that. I actually, I thought we were going to be moving forward on that. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter and Lohman, um, we have been inching towards it. Uh, you know, we we're using more of a health and all prism that, that sort of wraps in the equity and the sustainability and the um, health impacts. Uh, so we haven't we haven't perfected it yet, but we are we are working towards it. Thank you, Council. Anything else to bring up? If not, we are through our agenda. Council, I would look for a motion to adjourn this evening. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn this evening. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thanks much, council, for your work tonight. Thank you to the staff for the presentation and the information and to everybody who tuned in. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you. <laughs>